Assalamu alaikum, greetings my dear doctors and welcome everyone to our past paper course MRCP part 2 and our today's topic would be October 2020. Good evening sir. Okay. What is the most likely diagnosis? Extradural hematoma, frontotemporal meningioma, homoplastic osteoma, subdural hematoma, subarachnoid hemorrhage. A 38-year-old man is admitted to ED following a head injury sustained while playing football. He initially lost consciousness for two to three minutes, but then recovered. He had no obvious blow to the side of the head. Soon after arrival in ED, he suffers deteriorating consciousness and is neglecting the side of the body opposite to the injury. On examination, his BP is 165 by 89, while the pulse is 68 beats per minute and regular. CT scan is shown as below. So this is the CT scan of the patient. And so this is a very young patient and, and the patient has comes up with a massive head injury and the patient also has the features of lucid interval. So patient initially lost the consciousness then afterwards he recovered. So there is a lucid interval here with a massive head injury. And if you look at the CT scan here, there is a biconcave shaped lesion. This is limited by the suture line and, and this is limited within the, within the skull and within the dura matter. So what may be the most likely diagnosis here? EDH. Yes, very good. So this is a case of extradural hematoma, also known as the epidural hematoma. So which artery, which meningeal artery is ruptured in, 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 in case of extradural hematoma? Middle meningeal. Yes, the middle meningeal artery in case of extradural hematoma the middle meningeal artery would be ruptured. This is the most common uh, site of occlusion in case of extradural hematoma. And if, and if we look carefully at the question, this patient is having the hypertension as well as the bradycardia. So combination of hypertension and bradycardia, this is a component of the Cushing reflex. The Cushing reflex is a physiological nervous system response to increased intracranial pressure. That is the raised ICP that results in hypertension, bradycardia, and the white pulse pressure. Too. So hypertension, bradycardia, white pulse pressure, these are the features of pushing reflex. This occurs due to increased intracranial pressure. And this is most commonly seen in case of extradural hematoma. And how to differentiate between the extradural hematoma and the, uh, and the subdural hematoma? Anyone? So in case of extradural hematoma, the so so in case of extradural hematoma, the patient will have the lucid interval and usually follows the major head injury. And in case of subdural hematoma, this is usually seen in the elderly patient or having the chronic history of taking alcoholics following a trivial head injury. And patient will come with features of fluctuating consciousness. So extradural hematoma will have the major head injury. Subdural hematoma will have a trivial head injury and extradural hematoma will come with lucid interval. Subdural hematoma will come with a fluctuating consciousness. And if we get back to the CT scan, in case of extradural hematoma, there should be biconcave shaped, uh, biconcave shaped lesion or the lens shaped lesion that should be limited by the suture line and it will be uh, the, the blood will be accumulated in between the skull and the dura matter. And in case of epidural hematoma, the blood would be accumulated in between the dura matter and the arachnoid matter. And that, that is not limited by the suture line. And, and, and also that will have the shape of a biconcave shape. So let me show you the picture here. So look at here. This is the, this is the epidural hematoma or the extradural hematoma, lens shaped biconcave. This is limited by the suture line. So convex lens shaped occurs due to middle meningeal artery and you'll find a lucid interval. So this is lens shaped biconvex. And in case of subdural hematoma, it looks like something like a banana also known as the 
biconcave shape it and this is not limited by the suture line and this occurs due to rupture of the bridging veins and usually found in the elderly and alcoholic patient So look at here, this is the lens shape it, extradural hematoma, and this is the biconcave shape it, epidural hematoma. So this is subdural hematoma, and this is the epidural or the extradural hematoma. So epidural hematoma or extradural hematoma limited by the sutural line, and this is subdural hematoma not limited by the sutural line. And this one is the subarachnoid hemorrhage. Subarachnoid hemorrhage will give rise to a butterfly type of appearance. And this is epidural or extradural. This is subdural. This patient presentation is typical of an extradural hematoma with a blow to the frontotemporal ratio, leading to initial loss of consciousness. Following an initial recovery, further leakage of blood results in progressive loss of function resulting from completion of the cerebral cortex. In this CT scan, the edge of the hematoma appears white and there is clear loss of ventricular space because of the completion. Urgent neurosurgery to reduce the pressure is required. So patient will ultimately require the bar hole surgery. And in case of frontotemporal meningema, usually they arise from the sphenoidal wing. And, and this is also associated with the damage to the optic nerve, leading to some sort of visual disturbance or loss of color vision. The homoplastic osteoma, they are the slow growing asymptomatic tumor and they are also isodense with the bone. And, and often they are also associated with multiple osteomas seen in case of Gardner syndrome. And subdural hematoma will occur in between the dural space and the arachnoid membrane. And in case of acute subdural hematoma, the, the, the color of the lesion would be white. And in case of Chronic subdural hematoma, it should be of hypodense, something like a blackish color. And subarachnoid hemorrhage patient will have the uh, severe thunder club headache, especially in the occipital region. And this is often associated with the ADPKD or with the berry aneurysm. Okay, next one, please. What is the most likely diagnosis? Cataplexy, narcoplexy, narco, narcolepsy, REM sleep behavior disorder, restless leg syndrome, sleep waking disorder. A 45 year old man presents to neurology clinic with his wife who is concerned about his sleeping patterns. Most nights, three to four hours after going to sleep, he behaves strangely while sleeping, including sitting up in the bed, talking, kicking on occasion, and shouting and trying to grab his wife. When his wife can wake him, he can recall his dreams and he behaves normally. He is trying to withdraw from alcohol and has no symptoms of daytime som somnolence. His physical examination is unremarkable and blood results are normal. What is the most likely diagnosis? Cataplexy, narcolepsy, rapid eye movement, sleep behavior disorder, restless leg syndrome, sleep waking disorder. So can you tell the diagnosis from the scenario? All, all, the, all, the, features are, uh, all the features are happening during his deep sleep. So what can be the most likely diagnosis here? Or REM sleep disorder. Yes, REM sleep good. behavior disorder. This is the case of rapid eye movement sleep behavior disorder. So what are the features of cataplexy and narcolepsy? Oh, cataplexy most commonly occurs uh, during an emotional burst, like laughing or something. Yes, very good. So laughter, uh, fall or collapse following laughter indicates the cataplexy and in the context of extreme fatigue, cataplexy is highly specific for narcolepsy. So they are not related to the sleep behavior. And restless, in case of restless legs in the patient will have the uncontrollable or irresistible urge to move his legs, which, which usually occurs during the night time. And this is often associated with the iron deficiency anemia as well as the CKD or the renal impairment. And choice of treatment should be the uh, 
dopamine receptor agonist ropinidol and sleepwalking disorder sleepwalking disorder arises during the non rapid eye movement sleep pattern it's not in case of rem so these features are suggestive of the rapid eye movement sleep behavior disorder this patient presentation is typical of REM sleep behavior disorder. Episodes can be seen acutely when the patient are trying to withdraw from alcohol or have a neurodegenerative disorders like Parkinson's disease. So both alcohol withdrawal as well as the Parkinson's disease are significant risk factor for the REM sleep behavior disorder. In this case, once the period of alcohol withdrawal has passed, REM sleep behavior is likely to resolve. In others, without such an obvious indicator, this presentation is strong indicator of a prodermal phase two Parkinson's. And cataplexy, cataplexy will have the sudden involuntary loss of muscle control, following an emotional trigger, either laughter or unpleasant news. And this is and this cataplexy may be treated with the venlafaxine. And when cataplexy is associated with overwhelming data. Uh, overwhelming daytime drowsiness with extreme fatigue or sudden loss of muscle tone this indicates the narcolepsy narcolepsy should be treated with the modafinil and restless leg syndrome should be treated with the dopamine agonist like ropinidol apomorphine cabargulin or the dromocrypto and sleepwalking disorder usually arises during non rem sleep typically patient who appear to be asleep can perform complex automatic behavior Sleepwalking disorders differs from REM sleep behavior disorder as patient usually are awake with persistent confusion and drowsiness. So patient will be you patient will be in the state of either confusion or drowsiness, and this occurs in non-REM stage. And only the rapid eye movement disorder, the features are suggestive of this scenario here, which is often associated with the alcohol withdrawal or with the Parkinson's disease. What is the most appropriate management option for this patient with respect to the ventilator setting? Constant sedation should be maintained. Extrinsic positive and respiratory pressure should not exceed 12 um, uh, centimeter of water. Inspiratory time should be prolonged. D. Minimum breath frequency of 20 beats per minute should be maintained. E. Minimum pH of 7.3 should be maintained. A 64-year-old man is reviewed in the respiratory clinic. He has been experiencing an exacerbation of chronic obstructive pulmonary disease and is tiring. He is retaining carbon dioxide despite having been started on a non-invasive ventilation a decision is made to move to invasive ventilation what is the most appropriate management option for this patient with respect to the ventilator setting a constant sedation should be maintained b extrinsic peep should not exceed 12 centimeter of water c inspiratory time should be prolonged D, minimum breath frequency of 20 beats per minute should be maintained. E, minimum pH of 7.3 should be maintained. So this is a patient with a COPD exacerbation and they are planning for the invasive ventilation. And they are asking with respect to the ventilator settings. And if we look at the options here, the constant sedation will further relate for the list of the respiratory type 2 respiratory failure. So we, so we can go with the option A. And the EPAP, just remember E is the fifth letter of the alphabet. So in case of EPAP, the initial pressure should be 5 centimeter of mercury. And in case of IPAP, I is the ninth letter of the alphabet. And in case of IPAP, the initial pressure should be 10 centimeter. And this is based on the BTS guideline. And EPAP should be started at 5 centimeter of water and the maximum should be 12 centimeter. It should not exceed the 12 centimeter. So this is our most likely answer here and inspiratory time should be prolonged no copd is the copd and asthma they are the obstructive lung disease and all the obstructive lung diseases are the expiratory defect so the expiratory time should be prolonged here not the inspiratory time 
minimum breath frequency also should be low somewhat between uh, 15 or, or somewhat between 12 to 15 and also the pH should be less than 7.2 so the initial EPAP should be 5 centimeter and it should never exceed the 12 centimeter and in case of IPAP it should start with the 10 centimeter of mercury based on the PTS guideline. High levels of EPAP, EPAP uh, increases the risk of iatrogenic pneumothorax associated with mechanical ventilation. This is a particular risk in patients with COPD who are at increased risk of alveolar rupture. For this reason, the BTS guideline recommends EPAP must not be exceeded 12 centimeter of water. Initial level of EPAP can be set around 5 centimeter of water. So E is the fifth letter of alphabet, start at 5 centimeter. I is the ninth uh, letter of the alphabet, so IPAP should be started at 10 centimeter initially. And we should never go for constant sedation because this will further list to worsening of the type 2 respiratory failure. And COPD is a expiratory disease, so expiratory time here should be prolonged. And, and, they, are, and they usually maintain the ratio of 1 is to 3. And expiratory time should be the 3. And minimal breath frequency should be 10 to 15. You can remember the average is 12. And P should be in between 7.2 to 7.25. Two, uh, it should be slightly less than 7.3. Because if we if we, uh, if we we increase the P, there is a significant increase in the risk of lung injury. So it should be kept somewhere below 7.3. What is the most likely cause of this man's sim symptoms? A. EBV. B. Uh, herpes simplex virus. C. Listeria. D. Meningococcus. E. Tuberculosis. A 18 year old man presents to ED with severe throat, with sore throat, fever, headache, neck stiffness which have worsened over the last 48 hours. He had just started his first year at university. On examination, his temperature is 38.2, BP is 112 by 80, while his pulse is 91. And regular, bilateral cervical lymphadenopathy and inflamed tonsillar bed are observed. Neck stiffness and photophobia are also present. HB is 14.1, TLC is 7.2, platelet 2 lakh 91, sodium 144, potassium 5.4, creatinine is 215, which is raised, CRP is positive 62, uh, CSF glucose is 5.1, which is on the lower, which is on the higher side. CSF protein is 0.6 grams per liter. Microscopy uh, shows lymphocytosis. What is the most likely cause of this man's syndrome? EBV, HSV, Listeria, meningococcal, or TB? So can anyone tell me the diagnosis here? What may be the most likely cause of this patient's symptoms? Okay, let, let's, let's, go, let's go for the interpretation of the CSF. So CSF protein would be elevated in both bacterial infection as well as viral infection. And in case of bacterial infection, patient will have the low CSF glucose. But in case of viral infection, the patient will have the normal CSF glucose. The only exception is the mouse virus. Mouse virus is associated with low CSF glucose. So normal CSF glucose indicates viral uh, meningitis or viral encephalitis in all cases except mouse virus. And lymphocytosis is seen in case of viral infection as well as in case of chronic bacterial infection. So here since the, the, CSF, uh, the uh, CSF glucose level is normal with elevated protein with lymphocytosis. So most likely this is a case of viral origin. So here we are excluding the tuberculosis from here. So we have only epistin barbarus, arpacentex, listeria, meningococcus. So among the options given here, the meningococcus will come up with the purpuric crash. Listeria usually is seen in the oldest patient as well as in the cheese eaters. 
and 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 this list stereotypically affects the uh, pregnant lady herpes simplex virus will come with the temporal lobe changes and epstein virus has a special uh, pattern known as the atypical lymphocyte so the most likely cause of this machine symptoms is due to the epstein bar virus So the atypical lymphocyte, atypical lymphocyte points towards the glandular fever or infectious mononucleosis due to the Epstein-Barr virus infection. And also the upper respiratory symptoms treated with amoxicillin if the patient comes up with the features of rash, think of glandular fever or infectious mononucleosis due to Epstein-Barr virus. And atypical lymphocyte is always pathognomonic of the Epstein-Barr virus and choice diagnostic test would be the monospot test known as heterophil antibody test or Paul Bunnell test. A diagnosis of epstein bar virus infection is suggested here by the patient high temperature, pharyngitis, lymphadenopathy. So this patient is also having the features of pharyngitis, inflamed tonsillar with bilateral cervical lymph node. This can, this can also be explained with the help of epstein bar virus infection. The atypical lymphocytes are also typical of epstein barr virus when the CSF picture points towards the epstein barr virus related viral encephalitis. Supportive therapy comprising analgesia and fluid replacement where required is the intervention of choice. And herpes simplex virus usually comes with the cold shore or they will have the changes in the temporal lobe. And often patient comes with the memory impairment as well as the abnormal pattern of behavior. Okay, let me show you further. So history of gradual decrease in consciousness with short-term memory loss, gait disturbance, expressive dysphagia with MRI or CT changes showing increased signal intensity in the temporal lobe. And temporal lobe changes is always pathognomonic of heart simplex encephalitis, CSF showing lymphocytosis, elevated CSF protein, and sometimes they may give a history of business trip to Tokyo or to Japan. And most likely diagnosis is the herpes simplex encephalitis. Choice of investigation should be lumbar puncture and PCF. Choice of treatment IV acyclovir. And acyclovir is the DNA polymerase inhibitor. Next one is the listeria. So in case of listeria, there will be elderly patient with gradual loss of consciousness with history of eating French cheese or pregnant women, raise CRP, CSF lymphocytosis, and there should be features of meningism like headache, neck stiffness, and confusion. And always remember the listeria meningitis does not respond to septriaxone. So septriaxone can be given in the management of listeria meningitis. Listeria meningitis should be treated with combination of gentamicin plus either amoxicillin or ampicillin. Next one is the, although TB related meningitis does present with CSF lymphocytosis, this means symptoms don't fit with the TB infection. There are no respiratory symptoms suggestive of TB infection and meningism usually builds slowly or for a period of several days, worsening headache, drowsiness, and confusion of sleep. And meningococcus will come with a parporic type of rash. So meningococcal meningitis will come with the features of meningism as well as the parporic rash. And when the age of the patient is greater than three months onward, we can give the drug step triaxone. What is the next most useful investigation in this patient? A, autoimmune profile, B. City abdomen and pelvis with contrast. C. Cystoscopy. D. Renal biopsy. E. Testicular ultrasound scan. A 53 year old man presents to the nephro clinic for review. He has been experiencing night sweats and weight loss over the last three months. 
he has developed a left varicose seal. His GP has detected three plus of blood on urine analysis. On examination, his BP is 142 by 82, while the pulse is 82 beats per minute and is regular. He looks pale and his abdomen is soft, non-tender. BMI is 31 kg per meter square. Hemoglobin 9.2, TLC 11.7, platelets 3 lakh 1, sodium 144, potassium 4.8, creatinine is 132. What is the most useful investigation in this patient? Autoimmune profile. So can anyone tell me the diagnosis from here? What may be the most likely diagnosis? This patient is it is, RCC? Yes, very good. Yes. This is a case of RCC, renal cell carcinoma. So what should be the choice of investigation in case of RCC? So renal cell carcinoma patient will come with features of hematuria, features of malignancy and varicocele. Varicocele is a pathognomonic feature in case of renal cell carcinoma. And if there is left varicocele, usually this indicates left RCC. And when there is right varicocele, this usually indicates the right RCC. So triad of hematuria, varicocele, and there should be features of malignancy. Most likely diagnosis is the renal cell carcinoma. And choice of investigation should be contrast CT scan of abdomen and pelvis. So patient is having the features of uh, night sweat and weight loss pointing towards features of malignancy with hematuria, anemia, and left-sided varicocele. Since this is left varicocele, so this is a case of left-sided renal cell carcinoma. And most useful investigation should be the CT abdomen and pelvis, contrast CT abdomen and pelvis. Weight loss, night stress, and hematuria in the presence of left varicocele are suggestive of left renal cell carcinoma. Given that this patient uh, creatinine is only mildly elevated, a CT abdomen and pelvis with contrast to confirm the diagnosis is the most appropriate next step. Assuming a diagnosis of renal carcinoma is confirmed, then a CT thorax may well be required later to rule out the pulmonary metastasis. The inability to detect an abdominal mass on palpation is not uncommon in obese individuals. The left varicocele results from obstruction of the drainage from the left testicular vein. So obstruction of drainage from the left testicular vein leads to the varicocele. And varicocele hematuria features of malignancy points towards the RCC. What is the most likely cause of this patient's amenorrhea? Androgen insensitivity syndrome, classical congenital adrenal hyperplasia, polycystic ovarian syndrome, premature ovarian failure, Turner syndrome. A 18 year old woman presents to the endo clinic for review. She is concerned as she has not begun her menstrual periods. She is well. With no previous medical history of note, apart from the repair of bilateral inguinal hernia when she was a baby. On examination, her BP is 118 by 80. Pulse is 75 and regular. She is 182 centimeter in height and her BMI is 22. She has very sparse pubic hair, normal breast growth, and normal female external genitalia. What is the most likely cause of this patient's amenorrhea? EIS, CH, PCOS, premature ovarian follicle failure, and Turner syndrome. AIS. Yes, very good. This is the case of AIS, androgen insensitivity syndrome. Previously, it was known as the testicular feminization syndrome. And if you want to remember just one line regarding the AIS, remember patient will have normal breast development with no pubic or axillary hair or very sparse pubic and axillary hair. 
and this will have the XY karyotype. And usually the patient will be female. Externally, the patient would be female patient. So normal breast development with less or very sparse pubic hair and female external uh, female external phenotype. And often this type of patient comes with the bilateral inguinal hernia. So the most likely cause of this patient amenorrhea should be due to androgen insensitivity syndrome. So classical congenital adrenal hyperplasia, what is the commonest cause of classical CAH? Who is hydroxylase deficiency? 21 alpha yes, hydroxylase. So 21 alpha hydroxylase deficiency is the most common cause of classical CAH. Does classical CAH is present with hypertension or not? Uh, no, it's not. Yes, very good. So, <laughs> So the 21 hydroxylase deficiency, this is the most common cause of the classical congenital adrenal hyperplasia. And this is not associated with hypertension because 21 hydroxylase deficiency is associated with the salt wasting. So ultimately salt will be wasted. So patient won't develop the hypertension. But in case of 11 beta hydroxylase deficiency, there will be no features of salt wasting. In that case, patient will come up with the features of hypertension. So in case of premature ovarian failure, does the patient present with a secondary amenorrhea or primary amenorrhea? Secondary. Yes, so look at here. The primary amenorrhea is seen in case of androgen insensitivity syndrome, Turner syndrome, and the Kalman syndrome. And primary ovarian failure will have the secondary amenorrhea. And what are the features of Turner syndrome? Turner syndrome can be remembered with the with, with yes. Yes, go on. So Turner, uh, Turner syndrome can be remembered with the S. Which it will have short stature, short neck, low set hair with primary amenorrhea, borderline hypertension. Patient will have the XO karyotype and choice of inter intervention should be the hormonal replacement therapy. Androgen insensitivity syndrome results in patient with normal female external genitalia but no internal female organ. Patient with AIS often exhibit bilateral undescended testes and present with inguinal hernia a few weeks after birth. As pubic hair growth is dependent on the presence of androgen is either completely absent or at the very least first. Patient with AIS will have the XY karyotype. Classical congenital adrenal hyperplasia is characterized by salt wasting in childhood. Women with congenital uh, classical CH demonstrate signs of androgenization, including the ambiguous genitalia. In congenital adrenal hyperplasia, periods are often irregular rather than completely absent. So let me show you other features of the congenital adrenal hyperplasia. So patient will have the irregular menses, acne, hirsutism, early breast and pubic hair development, craterobegaly, male pattern baldness. So patient in CH will have the normal pubic hair development and in case of AIS either they should be completely absent or very little. In polycystic ovarian syndrome patient experiences irregular heavy periods and features of androgenization including acne and hirsutism, the condition is also seen more frequently in women who are above uh, ideal weight. In this case, the patient refers that she has experienced no period and her weight is within the normal risk, making the PCOS unlikely. Premature ovarian failure is associated with cessation of periods sometimes after they had already been commenced, that is the secondary amenorrhea or secondary ovarian failure. Evidence suggests that premature ovarian failure is probably autoimmune in origin and is seen more frequently in patients with other autoimmune pathologies. Premature ovarian failure is normally treated with hormone replacement therapy. Turner syndrome is associated with short stature, obesity, hypertension. Patients usually have a strict ovaries and primary amenorrhea is normally seen. Turner syndrome is characterized by exo character. Patient with Turner syndrome also exhibit dysmorphic facial features with epicanthic fold, low set hair, posteriorly rotated ears.
what is the most likely diagnosis bartel syndrome primary adrenal insufficiency rta type 1 rta type 2 rta type 4 is my voice clear or is it low so it's clear okay go on a 54 year old woman is referred to the renal clinic having suffered an episode of left renal colicky she has felt increasingly unwell over the last few weeks with lethargy and nausea she was previously diagnosed with sjogren syndrome on examination her bp is 138 by 84 while her pulse is 75 beats per minute and is regular her chest is clear her abdomen is soft and non tender bmi is 22 HB is ten point five, TLC seven, platelet one like ninety eight, sodium one forty three, potassium three point one, bicarb thirteen, and creatinine one fifty five. What is the most likely diagnosis? Bartel syndrome, primary adrenal insufficiency, RTA type one, RTA type two, or RTA type four. So this patient is having the hypokalemic metabolic acidosis. With renal impairment, the patient also has a history of previously diagnosed with shock brain syndrome and with episodes of left renal colic. So, what may be the most likely diagnosis here? RTA type two. So, how to differentiate between RTA type one, type two, and type four? Type four will be associated with uh, potassium will be high, sir. Yes, very good. And and in and in case of type one and type two, sir, the urinary pH is high in RTA type one. Type one. Mm -hmm. So in case of RTA type four, the patient will have hyperkalemic metabolic acidosis, and this is usually seen worsening after introduction of the AC inhibitor. And in case of RTA type one and RTA type two, patient will have the hypokalemic metabolic acidosis. So low potassium in case of type one, type two, and elevated potassium in case of type two. So how can I differentiate between type one and type two? In case of type one, this is usually associated with conditions like osteomalacia, nephrocalcinosis, primary biliary cirrhosis, shock brain syndrome, and SLE. And in type two, this is usually associated with the Fanconi syndrome. So hypokalemic metabolic acidosis plus either osteomalacia or nephrocalcinosis or history of primary biliary cirrhosis or Sjogren syndrome or SLE points towards the RTA type one. So this patient is having the Sjogren syndrome. So hypokalemic metabolic acidosis, either type one or type two, and the Sjogren syndrome is pointing towards the type one. And what should be the findings in case of Barter syndrome? Anyone? What should be the findings in case of Barter syndrome? Green abrasion. So in case of Barter yeah, syndrome, patient will have the hypokalemic metabolic alkalosis. So, and so we'll get the elevated bicarbonate level here. But here the patient is having the uh, pictures of acidosis, and in case of both Barter syndrome and Chittelman syndrome, we'll have the normal tension. So hypokalemic metabolic alkalosis has this four differential diagnosis, and in case of BG Barter syndrome and Chittelman syndrome, we'll have the normal tension, and Liddell syndrome, Cushing syndrome, we'll have the hypertension. So hypokalemic metabolic alkalosis plus normal tension points towards either Barter syndrome. Or Chittelman syndrome, but in our question here, the patient had the hypertension as well as the metabolic acidosis, so it can be Barter syndrome. So, how to differentiate between Barter syndrome and Chittelman syndrome? Anyone? How to differentiate between Barter no, and Chittelman? Of, uh... The age of the patient, uh, Barter syndrome will be in a younger age and will be deteriorated more than the Chittelman syndrome. Okay, very good. So just look at here. So B for butter, B for baby. In gentlemen, we will have. 
So B for barter, B for baby. So barter is the mul hapta childhood presentation and G for gentleman and G for gentleman. So gentleman mul hapta adulthood presentation. And low calcium excretion or hypocalciuria is a pathognomonic features of gentleman syndrome and hypovolemia is a feature of barter syndrome. And what should be the findings in primary adrenal insufficiency or in case of Addison's disease? Patient will have the metabolic acidosis, but the patient will have hyperkalemia with hyponatremia. So features of hypotension, hyponatremia, hypoglycemia. So everything would be low except the hyperkalemia, hypotension, hyponatremia, hypoglycemia, low urinary sodium, borderline hyperkalemia points towards the Addison's disease, also known as the adrenal insufficiency and urgent replacement of IV hypocortation should be administered. And patient may also come with features of anorexia, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea with weight loss and weakness. So patient will have low sodium, low glucose, only potassium would be elevated with metabolic acidosis. And ACT stimulation test or the short synectin test is the definitive diagnostic test. Renal tubular acidosis, RTA type 1, results in metabolic acidosis with hypokalemia and nephrocalcinosis. It occurs with increased frequency in con uh, conjunction with autoimmune condition, including Sjogren's syndrome, impaired hydrogen and excretion, hypercalciuria, decreased citrate excretion or sin. In RTA type 1, there is persistent urinary pH greater than 5.5, spite of metabolic acidosis. RTA type 1 is treated with oral bicarbonate or citrate supplementation. Barter will have hypokalemic metabolic alkalosis with normal tension and there is mutation in the sodium sodium potassium chloride co-transporter, the site of action in the, in the loop diuretics, in the thick ascending loop of Henle. Patient with barter syndrome will have the hypovolemia, so they will come up with the features of dehydration. Prim primary adrenal insufficiency, also known as Addison's disease, everything should be low except the hyperkalemia. And in case of RTA type 1, this is related to the Fanconi syndrome as well as the light chain nephropathy due to multiple myeloma. And RTA type 4 will have the hyperkalemia after introduction of the AC inhibitor or the mineral corticoid receptor antagonist like the spinolactone or the heparin. What is the most likely diagnosis? Graves disease, B. Hashimoto's disease, C. Secondary hyperthyroidism, D. Subacute thyroiditis, E. Toxic multinodular goiter. A 41 year old woman presents in endocrine clinic complaining of flu like symptoms, weight loss, and palpitation over the past three to four weeks. She has unintentionally lost four kgs in weight. She takes no regular medication and, us and is usually well. On examination, BP is 105 by 80. Pulse 102 beats per minute and regular. Her BMI is 22. She is, gen she is generally tender over the thyroid gland on palpitation. There is no proptosis. TSH 0.1, CRP 48, thyroid autoantibodies negative. What is the most likely diagnosis? So picture here is suggestive of the thyrotoxicosis here. And if we look at the options here, the Hashimoto, uh, the Hashimoto's disease will come up with the features of, uh, uh, with the features of hypothyroidism. So this is excluded. Secondary hyperthyroidism will have the elevated TSH level. So this is also excluded. And in case of Graves disease, the patient will either have the shin lesion or there should be features of Graves ophthalmopathy or as well as the proptosis. And this is not usually preceded by the flu-like symptoms. And toxic multinodular goiter will have the multiple nodules, not the not the generally tender thyroid gland. They have the multiple nodular shaped uh, multiple nodules on palpation. So 
most likely this is a case of subacute thyroiditis and subacute thyroiditis is also known as the decoherence thyroiditis and usually patient comes up following the post viral illness and there will be raised inflammatory marker and this is also associated with negative thyroid autoantibodies and there should be no, there should be no features of Graves ophthalmopathy as well as there should be no shin lesion so what are the thyroid autoantibodies expected in case of uh, Graves disease and Hashimoto's thyroiditis? TSH receptor antibody. Yes, the long-acting TSH receptor antibodies would be expected in case of Graves disease. Any other antibodies? Uh, TPO antibodies. Yes, very good. So, so the long acting TSH receptor antibody, this is specific for Graves disease and antithyroglobulin antibody, this is specific, specific for the Hashimoto's thyroiditis, but the anti-TPO antibody, this is overlapping, this is seen both in Graves disease as well as Hashimoto thyroiditis, but this is more commonly associated with Hashimoto's thyroiditis, around 95% cases and less commonly with Graves disease. So long-acting TSS receptor antibody only with Graves disease, antithyroglobulin antibody only with Hashimoto's thyroiditis, and anti-TPO has association with both Graves disease and Hashimoto's thyroiditis. So how can we differentiate? In case of Graves disease, patient will have features of thyrotoxicosis, and in case of Hashimoto's thyroiditis, patient will have features of hypothyroidism. So anti-TPO positivity plus features of thyrotoxicosis diagnosis is Graves disease, anti-TPO positivity plus features of hypothyroidism diagnosis Hashimoto's thyroiditis and decoherence thyroiditis also known as the subacute thyroiditis usually comes up with the features of transient thyrotoxicosis usually preceded by the post viral infection and this is usually tender. This patient has presented with post viral thyroiditis which results in flow-like symptoms raised inflammatory markers and initial symptoms of Thyrotoxicosis. These symptoms are the result of increased release of thyroid hormone rather than increased production. The thyroid is normally tender. There is no need for thioamide treatment. Insights are the initial intervention of choice for pain relief. In severe cases, a short course of prednisolone may be of value. The period of thyrotoxicosis may be followed by transient hyper hypothyroidism before a return to the normal and graves is with a flu-like illness and negative thyroid autoantibodies and the short duration of symptoms of stronger pointers towards the subacute thyroiditis rather than the graves disease graves disease is associated with positive anti-tpo antibodies long acting thyroid stimulating antibodies and thyroid eye disease in contrast to subacute thyroiditis graves disease is treated with thyroamides Hashimoto's thyroid uh, disease is associated with hypothyroidism and anti-TPO antibody would be positive and thyroxine replacement is the choice of treatment. And this Hashimoto's thyroiditis has increased chance of developing thyroid lymphoma around 60 to 80 fold increased chance. Secondary hyperthyroidism will have elevated TSEs. Toxic multinodular goiter will have the multiple nodules and there should be features of extrinsic airway compression. And to go for extrinsic airway compression uh, investigation, we should go with the respiratory flu loop volume. Okay, next. Which of the following most accurately describes what is shown in the rhythm strip? A. Failure of atrial capture. B. Failure of atrial inhibition. C. Failure of ventricular capture. D. Retrograde atrial activation. E. Ventricular un undersensing. A 72-year-old man who is known to have cardiac pacemaker inserted some years ago is admitted for overnight monitoring to the medical admissions ward following a collapse at hospital. He suffers a vacant period while being monitored at the rhythm strip is shown below. Which of the following most accurately describe what is shown in the rhythm strip? Failure of atrial capture, failure of ventricular atrial inhibition, 
failure of ventricular capture, retrograde atrial activation, and ventricular undersensing. So if we look at the ECG stripe here, there is bizarre pattern of the QRS complex. Initially, we are, we are getting the P wave here, and there is a long delay between here, and, and, and in between the long delay, there is only P wave seen. So this points towards the failure of the ventricular capture. And in case of failure of the atrial capture, there will be absent P wave, but here the P wave is present. And in case of failure of the atrial inhibition, the patient will have the atrial pacing spike. So there is a long gap here, only P wave is being seen, and there is a bizarre pattern of the QRS complex. All this are pointing towards the failure of the ventricular capture. The redo step seen here is consistent with failure of the ventricular capture. Two initial appropriately paced beat are followed by prolonged period. So two initially appropriately normal paced one and two, and there is a long gap in between this. And in between the long gap, only the POA is seen, not the QRS complex. Where spontaneous POA only are seen, this is followed by bizarre widened ventricular complexes. So the wider, so the QRS are the bizarre and widened, consistent with ventricular escape rhythm and intermittent malfunction of the ventricular pacing. Late could explain this event. And in case of failure of the atrial capsule is seen when the patient have an atrial pacing lead and the usual absence of POA. But here, the, since the POA is absent, it can be failure of the atrial capture. Failure of the atrial inhibition leads to atrial pacing spike, but, but we are getting no pacing spike here. Retrograde uh, atrial activation is not consistent with the rhythm strip seen here. What we see on the rhythm strip is a period of spontaneous P wave followed by ventricular escape rhythm. The risk of retrograde atrial activation is atrioventricular AV energy. And ventricular undersensing is usually seen in a patient with permanent pacing having the features of ventricular tachycardia. Okay, next one. What is the most appropriate choice of antibiotics to use in this patient? IV amox and Genta, oral clinda and IV Genta, Vanco and IG, IV Gentamycin, D, Vanco and IV Mero, E, Vanco, IV Pepracillin, Tezobac, and Oral Rifampicin. A 67-year-old man is admitted to the cardiology department with night sweats, weight loss, and new systolic murmur, which has de developed over the past three months. He has had several dental extraction over the last year. On examination, BP is 132 by 82, pulse 84. He has ejection systolic murmur, loudest at the left sternal edge. A few splinter hemorrhages are seen on examination on his fingernails. He is not in cardiac failure. HB 11.1, TLC 11.4, platelet 2 lakh 2. Sodium 144, potassium 4.5, creatinine 123, ESR is 85, and urine shows 1 plus blood with 1 plus protein. So this patient has come up with the features of fever plus neosystolic murmur. So fever plus neo heart murmur, the diagnosis is infective endocarditis, unless other spook and all the other features are also suggestive of infective endocarditis and the and the first step here should be detection of the etiology then after that we can choose the antibiotic so since there is a history of the dental extraction what might be the most likely etiology here this is going to be step orders because dental extraction was done one year ago So infective endocarditis etiology. So Staphylococcus aureus is the most common organism in case of infective endocarditis, except in one condition. Except in one. So except in one condition. If the heart fall replacement. Yes, go on. 
if the replacement of the wall is within within uh, one month no not within one month within within, within two months following the infection within two months for, just within two months so from the from the time mm -hmm. of valve surgery up to two months the most common organism is the Staphylococcus epidermidis. Other than this two months period, the Staphylococcus aureus is the most common organism. And A for aureus, A for acute presentation, and A for abusers. So patient will have acute presentation and often associated with the IV drug abusers. And Streptococcus mitis or Streptococcus sanguinis. They are the subtype of Streptococcus viridens. And Streptococcus viridens is the normal flora of the mouth, and they are related to either dental procedure or poor dental hygiene. So, so in the question, if they mention regarding any any dental procedure like dental extraction or poor oral hygiene, then the most likely organism should be the streptococcus viridus. And if they mention about the acute presentation or with the IV drug abusers, the most likely organism should be Staphylococcus aureus. And the coagulus negative Staphylococcus, such as the Staphylococcus epidermidis, commonly colonizes the indwelling lines and their most common cause of endocarditis in patient following the prosthetic valve surgery, usually as a result of perioperative contamination. So E for early and E for epidermidis. So epidermidis is related to the early valve endocarditis. And Streptococcus bovis, the subtype of the gallolyticus. So they are associated with colorectal cancer as well as the hepatobiliary pathology. So in case of streptococcus viridens, since this is related to oral dental hygiene or dental procedures, so the choice of investigation here should be the dental OPG. And usually the bovis is related to the colorectal cancer, so the default choice of investigation should be the colonoscopy. And if the colonoscopy is not unsuitable or colonoscopy is contraindicated, then we should go with the CT abdomen. And if the colonoscopy comes negative or if there is no features of colorectal cancer, then we should look for the biliary pathology and in order to detect the biliary pathology, we should go with the MRCP. So here, since there's a history of the dental extraction, so this points towards the streptococcus viridans pattern. So what should be the choice of antibiotic in case of streptococcus viridans induced uh, infective endocarditis? Anyone? What should be the choice of treatment in viridans pattern? We should go with the combination of IV gentamicin and amoxicillin. So this is the default choice of treatment or this is the first line choice of treatment in case of streptococcus viridans, IV amoxicillin and gentamicin. And if there is any penicillin allergy, then in that case, we can use the amoxicillin. In that case, we should go with the oral clindamycin and IV gentamicin. And if the MRS is suspected, methicillin resistance, then we should go with the vancomycin and IV gentamicin. Given that the man has not undergone any previous valve surgery and has had recent dental extraction, native valve endocarditis caused by streptococcus viridus is the most likely diagnosis. This patient ESR is elevated. There is mild edema, blood and protein are seen in the urine. This symptoms further support the diagnosis. Three sets of calcium should be taken, followed by a dual antibiotic therapy comp uh, comprising of amoxicillin and gentamicin. So amoxicillin gentamicin is the default choice of treatment. Amoxicillin provides adequate coverage for the streptococcus viridans infection and gentamicin is thought to be synergistic in achieving the bacterial clearance. So amoxicillin is the broad spectrum antibiotics and gentamicin will have the predominantly gram-negative activity. And clindamycin is only suitable if there is any history of allergic to penicillin. And if the streptococcus viridans or, or, or the streptococcus aureus organism is suspected or in case of MRSA, then we should go with the vancomycin. And, re and remember, the streptococcus aureus will come with, come with acute presentation, A for aureus, A for acute, and viridans will come, come with the subacute presentation. Okay, next one. What is the most appropriate initial intervention for this patient? A, cholestyramine. B. Cyclosporin. C. Methotrexate. D. Prednisolone. E. UDCA. 
48 year old woman is referred to hepatoclinic with gradually worsening of lethargy and itching over the last few months. Her GP has noted abnormal transaminase level. Apart from mild asthma, she is usually well and takes no regular medications. On examination, BP 115 by 82, pulse 82, beats per minute in regular, she has obvious scratch mark over her upper abdomen and looks pain. There are two finger breath, hepatomegaly and multiple spider nevi. HB is 9.1, TLC 11.7, platelet 1 like 12, sodium 143, potassium 5, Threat 9115, ALT is 872, ALP 150, bilirubin 21, and asthma is positive. So most likely diagnosis here. The asthma is positive. Asthma is associated with which one? Autoimmune. Yes, asthma is associated with the autoimmune hepatitis so and anti lkm1 and then anti smooth muscle antibody they are associated with the autoimmune hepatitis and autoimmune hepatitis will also have the elevated trans minus level and along with the two finger with hepatomegaly and multiple spider nephew so what should be the initial intervention in any in, in patient yes very good we should go with the prednisolone and if the patient does not respond to prednisolone what should be the second line drug in AIH cycle no not the cycle phosphonate we should go with the GMAID we should go with the methotrexate and and if still the patient does not uh, respond to the GMAID methotrexate then we should go with the cyclosporine so can anyone tell me the mode of action of cyclosporine CNI inhibitor. Yes. And what is the indication for arsodeoxycholic acid? Itching. Arsodeoxycholic acid is used for the management of itching or pruritus in case of early PSC or early PVC. And in case of advanced cases, we need to go with the cholesteramine. And cholesteramine is also indicated in case of bowel, bowel resection induced bile acid diarrhea. This patient has autoimmune hepatitis as evidenced by elevation in transaminase and in the absence of a significant rise in ALP. The asthma seen in this patient also fits with this clinical picture. Prednisolone is the initial intervention of choice, induces clinical laboratory histological improvement in 80% of the patient with autoimmune hepatitis. It is usually co uh, combined with a steroid sparing acid like the azathioprine. And cholesteramine is for the management of itching in advanced PBC or PSC. Cyclosporine, if there is no response to prednisolone or the steroid sparing as a therapine, as well as the methotrexate. Methotrexate is indicated if no response to prednisolone. And arsodeoxycholic for the management of itching or pruritus in early PBC or early PSC. Which of the following autoantibodies is the most likely cause of this patient's muscle weakness? A. ACH receptor B. Amphiphysin C. Recoverin D. Voltage-gated calcium channel E. NTO A 62-year-old man is a uh, presence to the recipe clinic complaining of proximal muscle weakness, which has developed over the last few weeks. He smokes 40 cigarettes per day and has a cough with intermittent hemoptysis. On examination, proximal muscle weakness affecting the muscle of the shoulders and hips is seen. Pores, crackle and wheezes are present on auscultation of the chest consistent with COPD. Investigation HB 13.7 TLC 11 platelet 3 lakh 2 sodium 134 potassium 3.7 creatinine 115 ESR 85. The x-ray is as shown below. 
So there is the inhomogeneous lung mass here. And if we look at the look at the scenario here, the, the patient is having most probably this patient is having the underlying lung malignancy. And patient has come up with the features of paraneoplastic uh, uh, paraneoplastic features. So patient is having the proximal myopathy along with features of hyponatremia. So which which lung cancer can it be? Is it squamous or, or is it small cell lung cancer? Uh, I think it's small cell because of Lambert Eaton syndrome. Yes. So the small cell lung cancer, it has association with SIADs, Cushing syndrome, lambert eaton myasthenic syndrome, as well as the paraneoplastic cerebellar degeneration. And squamous cell lung cancer has association with hypercalcemia due to increased release of parathyroid hormone related factor. So here the hyponatremia, hyponatremia is one of the one of the biggest pointer towards small cell lung cancer. And the features are sensitive of the lambert eaton myasthenic syndrome proximal myopathy with proximal muscle weakness affecting the muscles of shoulders and hip pain. So what should be the choice of investigation in case of limbs? Uh, it should be deep. gated. Yes, you should go yes. with the voltage gated calcium channel. An anti-U antibody is associated with which condition? Breast cancer. And other than breast cancer, go on. So the anti-U antibody, the anti-U antibody is associated with the paraneoplastic cerebellar degeneration, and that paraneoplastic cerebellar degeneration is also associated with small cell lung cancer as well as the breast and ovarian cancer. This patient has presented with proximal myopathy in the presence of the likely small cell lung cancer. The most probable cause is lambert eaton myasthenic syndrome. Features that differentiate limbs from myasthenia gravis include potential reinforcement of muscle strength with repeated movement. So in case of lambert eaton myasthenic syndrome, there will be improvement of features or improvement of symptoms following exertion or following repetition of movement and which should be worsened in case of myasthenia gravis. The initial choice for limbs is uh, 3,4 diaminopyridine, which inhibits potassium channel, prolonging presynaptic nerve terminal membrane depolarization. This enhances the calcium entry and improves the release of acetylcholine. And amphivacin is the cause of stiff person syndrome and encephalomyelitis. Recovering small cell lung cancer and TU with the paraneoplastic cerebellar degeneration, which is also associated with the breast and ovarian cancer. What is the most appropriate treatment option for this patient? A. Bortezomab. B. Colchicine. C. Inclisiren. D. Entoresin. E. Tefamides. A 28-year-old man presents to the cardio clinic with worsening shortness of breath and decreased exercise tolerance. He is known to have familial transthyretin amyloidosis. He has experienced symptoms of neuropathy over the past few years, but has so far refused specialist anti-TTR therapy. He is now willing to reconsider this. On examination, BP 105 by 82, pulse 89 and regular, bilateral crackles on the lung basis, on the auscultation of the chest and bilateral pitting edema at investigations are normal hb 13.6 tlc 7.1 platelet 3 lakh 50 sodium 143 potassium 4.5 creatinine 112 
So what may be the diagnosis here? Dilated cardiomyopathy. So this is a case of transthyretin amyloidosis induced cardiomyopathy. So what should be the choice of treatment? And, and this patient has also the features of neuropathy as well. So neuropathy plus cardiac failure with underlying transthyretin amyloidosis. So what should be the most appropriate option here? We should go with the tophamidis. So transthyretin amyloid cardiomyopathy should be treated with tophamidis and tophamidis causes reduction in the amyloid fibrils formation leading to stabilization of the amyloid tetramers and this causes this reduces the progression of neuropathy as well as the cardiac failure. Transthyretin amyloid cardiomyopathy patient will have features of cardiac failure as well as the neuropathy. So patient is having the features of cardiac failure as well as the neuropathy. So we should treat the patient with tafomitis and tafomitis causes reduction in the amyloid fibrils formation. So look at here, tafomitis for transthyretin amyloid cardiomyopathy and Ionotercin for polyneuropathies of hereditary transthyretin mediated amyloidosis. So this is also transthyretin mediated, and this is this can only treat the polyneuropathy. This can treat the cardiac failure. So for treating the cardiac failure as well as the neuropathy, we should go with the tophamidis. And incrisiran, incrisiran is the PCSK9 inhibitor, and this causes reduction in the LDL cholesterol level on the top of maximum statin therapy and bortezomib is used in the management of multiple myeloma so can anyone tell me the full form of pcsk9 which one is another drug also acting on the pcsk9 and the drug is the evo evolocumab and pcsk9 means pro protein converted subtalazine or kixin d type 9 so what evolocumab Tophamidis stabilizes the amyloid tetramers, reducing amyloid fibril formation and the progression of neuropathy and cardiac failure. In a patient with Nihat L3 card, uh, heart failure, tophamidis has been shown to reduce both mortality and cardiovascular related admission. It is prescribed at a dose of 80 mg once per day. Urinary tract infection and diarrhea are a very common side effects in the patient prescribed with this medication and bortezomib, this is for the management of multiple myeloma. Polkicin is usually used for the management of acute pericarditis or, or in case of acute gout when the other drugs like incise or steroids are contraindicated as well as in case of familial Mediterranean fever. Inclisiran, inclisiran is the PCSK9. This, is, this causes significant reduction in the LDL cholesterol on the top of maximum statin therapy. And inotercin for the inotercin can only, only treat the neuropathy. This can treat the cardi uh, cardiomyopathy or the cardiac failure. So if a patient with transthyretin amyloidosis comes up only with the features of neuropathy, no cardiac failure. In that case, we can go with the inotercin. But if the patient has both a cardiac failure as well as the neuropathy, then choice of that should be the tophamidis. What is the most appropriate intervention for this patient? A, sorry, fluticasone. You, sir, I don't know how to pronounce that. Yumi Sledinium and Vela Valentirol B Fluticasone and Salmitrol C Mandibular Advancement Device D Tyrotropium and Olodatrol E Weight Loss A 49-year-old man comes to the recipe clinic with his wife who complains that he is tired all the time, snores heavily at the night and seems to have no energy. He works as a driver but has stopped working in morning and evening because he is too tired. 
he is type 2 diabetic for which he takes metformin twice daily he also has hypertension which is treated with remipril he is a non smoker on examination bp 155 by 90 pulse 75 and regular he is obese with reduced chest expansion the bmi is 34 hb 14.9 tlc 7 platelet 3 lakh 22 sodium 144 potassium 4.8 bicarb is on the higher side 33 creatinine 112 forced vital capacity is 85 percent predicted and fev1 by fevc is 75 percent so what is the most appropriate intervention so what may be the diagnosis here obstructive sleep apnea yes very good this is the case of obstructive sleep apnea so so what should be the choice of management cpap but it's not there so mandibular devices this is not actually the obstructive sleep apnea syndrome look at the scenario very carefully the patient is having the features of snoring obesity and there is significant elevation in the bicarbonate pointed towards the metabolic acid so this is actually a case of obesity hypoventilation syndrome okay this is a case of obesity hypoventilation syndrome so sir how would you differentiate between the two okay i'm i'm, I'm coming back so snoring with excessive daytime somnolence, obesity with reduced chest expansion, significant reduction in the FVC with normal FEV1 FVC ratio with features of carbon dioxide retention and significant elevation of the bicarbonate. And this significant elevation of the bicarbonate indicates the metabolic compensation for the respiratory acidosis. Most likely diagnosis is the obesity hypoventilation syndrome which is also known as the peak weekend syndrome and the mainstay of treatment is the weight reduction and followed by the leader glutide and leader glutide is usually indicated when the uh, when the bmi is greater or equal to 35 kg per meter square and in case of obstructive sleep apnea syndrome the 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 they will usually don't have the this type of lung picture this type of lung picture would be absent So fluticasone, umeclidinum, can anyone tell me the whose group of drug is umeclidinum as well as the Vilanterol? Whose group of drug is Vilanterol and uh, Olodaterol? Think of Salmeterol, Formeterol, you, you will find easily. So triotropium, glycopyrrolate or glycopyronium, umeclidinium as well as the actlidinium. They are the long-acting muscarinic antagonists. Remember, they are the antagonists, not the agonists. And salmeterol, formeterol, vilanterol, olodaterol. They are the long-acting beta agonists and they are used in the management of COPD. So umeclidinium is the lama, vilanterol is the lava. This is used in the management of COPD. Fluticasone salmeterol is used in the management of asthma as well as COPD. Again, triatromium olodaterol in case of uh, COPD. Mandibular adverse device is usually indicated if, if the patient has the uh, uh, mild features of obstructive sleep apnea syndrome. And weight loss is the mainstay of treatment in case of obesity hypoventilation syndrome. This patient is likely to have obesity hypoventilation syndrome with snoring, daytime sleepiness, evidence of carbon dioxide retention, the elevated bicarbonate suggests metabolic compensation for respiratory acidosis. This patient FPC is reduced, although his FEV1 FPC ratio is in the normal risk, which is consistent with the diagnosis of the obesity hypoventilation sy syndrome. In this situation, weight loss is the most appropriate intervention where patient uh, can close with, uh, with lifestyle major cell high dose lira glutide is one of the potential options so can anyone tell me the mode of action of lira glutide yes what's the mode of action of lira glutide go on lira glutide 
post parental they act on post parental blood sugar are they megalonectites i am confused lira chloride is the clp1 agonist okay clp1 agonist and omeclirinum this is the muscarinic antagonist lama and filanterol solmeterol formeterol as well as the olodenterol they are the lava <laughs> long acting beta agonist and mandibular advancement device in case of mild to moderate sleep apnea and for severe sleep apnea or moderate sleep apnea we need to go with the continuous positive airway pressure which of the following is most likely to have contributed to this patient's condition a decrease antithrombin 3 b decrease protein c activity c factor 5 laden b increase plasmin e increase protein s levels a 64 year old woman presents to ed with sudden onset left sided pleuritic chest pain she has nephrotic syndrome on examination bp 102 by 70 pulse 95 and regular spo2 is 91 on romea chest is clear her abdomen is soft and non tender there is bile there is pitting edema to the mid thigh bilaterally hb 10.2 tlc 7.7 .7, platelet 376 sodium 135 potassium 3.7 tretinin is 152. So this is the patient with nephrotic syndrome. Drum. Antithrombin 3. Yes, so so, so patient with nephrotic syndrome will have the reduction in the antithrombin 3 level. And this antithrombin 3 level is directly proportional to the level of the albumin. The less would be the level of the al albumin, the less would be the antithrombin 3 level. So they are directly proportional. This patient has likely pulmonary embolism indicated by pyuretic chest pain and reduced oxygen saturation. Antithrombin 3 level falls in proportion to the level of the urinary albumin excretion. In patient with nephrotic syndrome, excretion of albumin is markedly elevated and the significant fall in uh, antithrombin 3 is in. This helps drives up through coagulant state and increases the risk of venous thromboembolism in patients with nephrotic syndrome. Prophylactic anticoagulation is usually considered in patients with nephrotic syndrome when the albumin level falls below 25 gram per liter. And factor 5 laden mutation or protein C mutation is the most common cause of the inherited disorder, inherited bleeding disorder. Okay, next one. What is the most likely diagnosis? And to amoeba histolytica, giardiasis, norvovirus, salmonella, gastroenteritis, shigella dysentery. A 19-year-old woman presents to ED with three-day history of diarrhea containing blood and mucus and left-sided abdominal pain. She has just flown home after a stay in Backpackers Hotel in Singapore. A friend gave her some amoxicillin, which does not appear to have helped her symptoms. On examination, temperature 37.9. BP is 102 by 70, pulse 94 and regular, abdomen is soft, though tender in the left iliac fossa. She has active bowel sounds. HB 12.3, TLC raise 13.7, platelet 3 lakh 2, sodium 143, potassium slightly lower 3.4, creatinine 145 raised, CRP is raised 154. So, what is the most likely diagnosis? So, this is the case of infective diarrhea and step one would be to look for the incubation period. So, the incubation period here is three days and there is also the bloody diarrhea along with the left iliac fossa pain. So, what may be the most likely diagnosis here? Okay. 
So three days incubation period, bloody diarrhea plus, plus late <laughs> iliac push up in. What may be the most likely diagnosis? Go on, try. Shigila, sir. Yes, very good. So this is due to the Shigila. So incubation period, very short incubation period, one to six hours, staphylococcus aureus, bacillus cereus, 12 to 48 hours, salmonella, E. coli, 48 to 73 hours, shigella, campylobacter, and greater than seven days with long incubation period, GIDSS and amoebiosis. How to differentiate between GIDSS and amoebiosis? So GIDSS is uh, has bloody diarrhea. Okay. So both amoebiosis okay. as well as GIDSS, okay. both of them will have the prolonged okay. incubation period, and both of them are are related to the Indian subcontinent. And in case of amoebiosis, the patient will have the bloody diarrhea, and in case of GIDSS, patient will have non-bloody diarrhea, and there should be features of malabsorption. And features of malabsorption are diarrhea, statory, and the weight loss. So, how to differentiate between Shigella and, uh, and the Salmonella? Rose spots, step ladder pattern of fever in Salmonella. So, norovirus. Norovirus is the most common cause of gastroenteritis in the in the adult population, and this usually Hello? occur. This usually. Can you hear me? Is my voice clear? Hello. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Okay. So the connection was broke in between. Okay. So norovirus is the most common cause of gastroenteritis in in a most, most common cause of gastroenteritis in the adult population, and this usually occurs in an epidemic form in the closed environment, like either in the cruise ship or in a closed building. And they usually gives the classical description of projectile vomiting and explosive diarrhea. And shigellosis, salmonellosis, both of them will come with the features of bloody diarrhea. And in case of salmonellosis, so your voice is not audible. So salmonellosis as well as the shigellosis, both of them will come with the features of bloody diarrhea and usually they have the same type of incubation period. But in case of salmonellosis, we can get either the features of, features of rash or there should be features of relative bradycardia. And shigellosis is more commonly seen in the child daycare and salmonellosis in the nursing home. And shigellosis usually comes with the left iliac fossa pain. And there would be no uh, left iliac fossa pain in salmonellosis. So presence or absence of left iliac fossa pain is a, is a very differentiating point between salmonellosis and shigellosis. Step aureus will have a very short incubation period and the uh, vomiting is the main presenting features. And this is related to the buffet display food particles made from milk like the cream and the dairy products. Another short incubation period also occurs in the uh, bacillus series which is related to the reheated fried rice of Chinese restaurant. Clostridium jejuni is related to the wedding meal and wedding meal means contaminated meat and poly, poultry or dairy products and the sorry not the Clostridium jejuni, the Campylobacter jejuni is usually associated with some sort of renal impairment. So since the patient is having the left iliac fossa pain with three days incubation period with bloody diarrhea the most likely diagnosis is the Shigella dysentery. This patient presentation is consistent with Shigella infection or three to seven days history of abdominal pain, often on the left side, coupled with bloody diarrhea and pain and pulsing in stool. Outbreak of Shigella are known to occur in daycare facilities where individuals have shared accommodation, such as backpackers hostel, as it may be used to shorten the duration of symptom. And in case of entomoebia histolytica, patient will have a long intubation period with bloody diarrhea. GIDSS long incubation period plus non-bloody diarrhea features of malabsorption, 
norovirus gastroenteritis is the most common cause of uh, gastroenteritis in the adult population and patient will come with explosive diarrhea and projectile vomiting salmonella won't have the left iliac fossa pain what is the most useful intervention for this patient a factor 7 b ffp c protamin sulfate d prothrombin complex concentrate e vitamin k a 74 year old man is admitted to ed with severe tearing abdominal pain radiating to his back he takes warfarin for atrial fibrillation he had an abdominal aortic aneurysm but defaulted to usg follow up on examination bp 95 by 70 pulse is 125 and irregular a bleeding abdominal aortic aneurysm is confirmed on the scan as he is prepared for the surgery a point of care international normalized ratio is 4.7 what is the most useful intervention for this patient so diagnosis here uh, warfarin induced yes this is the case of warfarin induced severe bleeding or warfarin induced coagulopathy so what should be the management in warfarin induced coagulopathy prothrombin concentrate sir yes very good we should go with the pcs So, in case of warfarin induced coagulopathy, especially if the INR is greater than eight or if there is significant hemorrhage, then we should go with the prothrombin complex concentrate containing factor two, seven, nine, and ten, and those should be twenty-five to fifty unit per kg. And IV vitamin K, this may be given as an adjunctive therapy. Always remember, the specific management for warfarin induced coagulopathy is the prothrombin complex concentrate, and IV vitamin K is only as an adjunctive treatment protocol and if the prothrombin complex concentrate is not found then what should be the choice ffp yes we should go with the ffp fresh frozen plasma what is the antidote for protamin sulfate heparin is say so it's the antidote for heparin yes protamin sulfate is the antidote for heparin The most effective direct reversal agent for warfarin is prothrombin complex concentrate. It will work quickly and contains all of the clotting factors that are impacted by warfarin therapy. These are factors two, seven, nineteen. Prothrombin should be given at a dose of three to fifty units per kg. Fresh frozen plasma is only considered for warfarin reversal when the prothrombin complex concentrate is not available. Protamin sulfate is a reversal agent for heparin. And vitamin K can be given in addition to prothrombin complex concentrate, but this is not the primary intervention. So go with the PCC. If PCC is not found, go with fresh frozen plasma. What is the most likely cause of this patient's symptom? A. Alzheimer's disease. B. IIH. C multi infarct dementia D NPH E parkinson's disease Seventy four year old male presents to the neurology clinic for review. His wife is very concerned as he has suffered from progressive short term memory loss over several months, in addition to falls and incontinence of urine. He has hypertension and had an inferior MI four years ago. He is otherwise well. On examination, BP one thirty by one thirty by eighty five. Pulse seventy five beats per minute and regular. No postural drop in BP is noticed. You note that he has a magnetic gait. His mini mental state examination score is twenty four by thirty. There is no papillary edema on fundoscopy. HB fourteen point two, TLC seven, platelet three lakh eleven, sodium one thirty four, potassium four point eight, creatinine one one two. Everything is normal. The CT Scan is performed, and this is shown as below. 
So the CT scan is showing the enlargement of the third and fourth ventricle here. And if we look at it, this patient has come up with the, with the triad of DUC, dementia, urinary incontinence, and gait disturbance. So what should be the most likely? Uh, NPH. Yes, this is a case of normal pressure, high prostaglis. So patient will have the features of DUC, dementia, short-term memory loss, urinary incontinence, gait aprosia disturbance and MRI or CT scan will show the hydrocephalus with an enlarged ventricle and this should be out of keeping with the degree of the sulcal atrophy and initial intervention should be the therapeutic lumbar function. So let me show you some of the more pictorial related to NPH. So the ventricle should be much more enlarged in case of normal pressure hydrocephalus. They are showing the enlargement of the ventricles. The ventricles are enlarged. And as well as just see here, there would be uh, there would be a vertex sulcal crowding and dilatation, and there should be prominent sylvian fissure and bulging of the ventricular margin like this. The prominent sylvian fissure with bulging of the ventricular margin, the ventricular margin is prominent here and the colossal angle at the posterior commissure is at around 50 to 80 degree. So these are the CT or MRI findings in case of normal pressure hydrocephalus. So vertex cycle crowding and dilatation or enlarge or enlargement of the ventricles, prominent sylvian fissures with bulging of the ventricular margin and colossal angle at around 50 to 80 percent at the posterior commissure. And initial uh, initial uh, intervention is the therapeutic lumbar puncture. This patient exhibits the classical triad of symptoms consistent with NPS, memory loss, incontinence, and gait disturbance. In keeping with the diagnosis, papilledema is absent here. The CT scan shows ventricular enlargement out of keeping with the sulcal hypertrophy, typical of NPH. CSA pressure on lumbar puncture is either normal or slightly elevated and insertion of shunt in some patient may control the symptoms. And Alzheimer's disease will only come with, will only come with the features of dementia. There should be no gait gaze disturbance, no urinary incontinence. And next one is the idiopathic intracranial hypertension. Can anyone tell me the features of IIH? Idiopathic intracranial hypertension. So obese female who comes with symptoms of papilloedema and headache. Yes, very good. Anyone else? Why others are not talking, others are keeping silent. This is actually interactive session, so you should talk. So chronic postural headache with morning worsening with history of sudden worsening of the headache usually in the young obese female with bilateral papilledema hypertension. So papilledema will always be present in IIH and papilledema would be absent in normal pressure hydrocephalus with elevated t dimer and in this case the MRI venogram, magnetic resonance venogram with or without LP and pressure measurement is the investigation of modalities. Weight reduction is the mainstay of the treatment and we should also, we should also add the Acetazolamide, carbonic androidase inhibitor, along with weight reduction.
and in case of multi infarct dementia patient will have the significant vascular or cardiovascular risk factor and there will be stepwise deterioration in the cognitive impairment and in case of parkinson's disease we will get the features of bradic anisha tremor and the shuffling catch What is the most appropriate treatment to provide this patient prior to surgery? A. Cabergolin, B. Domperidone, C. Liraglutide, D. Octereotide, E. Phenoxybenzamine. A 45-year-old female is reviewed in endoclinic prior to the surgery to remove pituitary adenoma. She presented to GP a few weeks ago with hypertension, diabetes, mellitus, and changes in her facial appearance, including prognathism and macroglossia. On, ex on examination, BP is 165 by 102, pulse is 84. Her BMI is 23. All the investigations, HB, TLC, platelet, sodium, potassium, they are normal. Glucose is high, 13.1, and IGF-1 is raised, 205. So what may be the most likely diagnosis here? Acromegaly. Yes, very good. Acromegaly. So what is the first line choice of treatment in acromegaly? So now it is surgery, transphenoid a removal of the tumor. So transphenoid surgery is the first line choice of modalities according to the past medicine, but based on the past test, they are saying that the, okay, I'm showing it. So in case of acromegaly, if the uh, insulin-like growth factor IGF-1 is elevated, then we should suspect the acromegaly and for the next step would be to confirm the diagnosis. And confirmation of diagnosis would be OCTT with growth hormone measurement. And if the growth hormone fails to suppress below 1 mg per deciliter, then the uh, diagnosis of acromegaly is confirmed. And for this reason, this test is also known as the growth hormone suppression test. And after confirming the diagnosis, the next logical step should be pituitary MRI to go for the management protocol. And based on the past test, the LAN reuted is the first line choice of drug. Since this is non-invasive procedure, so we should uh, start with the pharmacological therapy. And the definitive choice of treatment is the transpenoidal surgery. And this octreotide, octreotide is often used as an adjunctive therapy along with transpenoidal surgery. So first line is the landreotide, definitive is the transpenoidal surgery and adjunctive is the octreotide. And octreotide is the somatostatin analog. So the most appropriate treatment to provide this patient prior to surgery is the octreotide as an adjunctive therapy prior to surgery. Octreotide is a somatostatin analog used to treat acromegaly and carcinoid tumors. Octreotide can reduce the growth hormone levels by up to 50% in patients with acromegaly. This improves their blood pressure and glucose control prior to surgery, reducing the morbidity associated with surgical intervention. Long-acting preparation of octreotide are given at a dose of 20 mg every four weeks to improve symptoms of prior to surgery. Not all patients require primary medical therapy, but is indicated here due to presence of macroglossia, which may inhibit, inhibit a safe intubation. So what is the indication of cabergolin? Cabergolin is the dopamine receptor agonist. It can be used in the management of uh, Prolectinoma, Prolectin yes, prolectinoma. And domperidone is the gastroprocrinic tiktok. This can be used for the management of nausea vomiting in a patient with diabetes. Liraglutide. Liraglutide is the CLP1 agonist. And this is usually used in a, in a diabetic patient having the high BMI, like greater or equal to 
35 kg per meter square or, or in a patient with non-alcoholic state of hepatitis with significant BMI and octreotide is our answer here and phenoxybenzamine. Phenoxybenzamine is used for the management of fugomocytoma. So P is for uh, phenoxybenzamine, P is for fugomocytoma. So cabergoin is the dopamine receptor agonist. Other dopamine receptor agonists are the apomorphin bromocryptin. Domperidone is the gastroprokinetic drug. Liraglutide is CLP1 agonist. And phenoxybenzamine is the alpha, uh, alpha receptor blockers. What is the most likely diagnosis? Bronchioalveolar carcinoma of the bronchus, bronchitis, C, bronchial carcinoid, D, cystic fibrosis, E, hiatus hernia. Fifty-one-year-old male is referred to Respi Clinic after the third episode of left lower lobe pneumonia. He is a non-smoker and has suffered from recurrent respiratory tract infection on multiple occasions since childhood. He is married and have two children. On examination, he is apyrexial. The BP is 123 by 80, pulse 78 and regular. There are crackles at the left base on auscultation. All the investigations are normal except mild rays in CRP, which is 28. CT is as shown as below. So look at this CT scan. There are the grips like clusters here. And also there is significant dilatation in the bronchi. Significant dilatation in the bronchi here. And this patient is also having the uh, history of recurrent respiratory tract infections since childhood. So what may be the most likely diagnosis here? Bronchiectasis. Yes, very good. So so what are the other CT findings in bronchiectasis? Signet cell. Signet. And tram tract appearance. So the bronchoarterial ratio is usually greater than 1.5, lack of bronchial tapering, bronchial visualized close to the pleural surface. And there should be three in bad appearance. So let's go back to this. So this is this this type of picture is known as the three in bad appearance and also known as the Graves cluster. And there is significant dilatation in the bronchi. So all the features are suggestive of the bronchiectasis. This patient has changes in the left lung base consistent with bronchiectasis and with a bunch of graves area of changes with dilated thick walled bronchi, coupled with recurrent episodes of lower respiratory tract infection and persistent crackles on auscultation. This fits with the diagnosis of bronchiectasis. The patient should be screened for underlying causes of bronchiectasis such as immunoglobulin deficiency. But recurrent episodes of infection occur as seen here, rotating antibiotics should be considered. Eventually, lung resection can be considered in patient with recurrent localized infection. Mm -hmm. And bronch bronchial carcinoid usually occurs in the young patient and patient will come with the features of recurrent hemoptysis and, and on bronchoscopy will get the cherry red colored lesion. And cystic fibrosis usually comes up with the constipation failure to thrive, and this is not usually associated with recurrent respiratory tract infection. What is the most likely diagnosis? Anterior spinal artery infarction. Iotic dissection, EDH, Gullion Barry syndrome, transverse mellitus. A 78 year old woman presents to ED having been unable to stand after a plane journey home from, from a holiday in Egypt. She had been unwell for the past three days with diarrhea and is found 
and found it difficult to keep up with her fluids. On examination, BP is 135 by 72, pulse is 72 and regular, heart sounds are regular. And normal chest is clear, neurological examination of the upper limb is unremarkable as the cranial nerve, as in cranial nerve examination. Lower limb power is reduced, which is one by five, power bilaterally and reduced tone. Fine touch, joint position, sense and vibration sense are intact, while knee and ankle reflexes are decreased. Pin prick and temperature sensation are reduced on both lower limbs. Anal tone. Everything is normal. MRI shows MRI of cervical and thoracic spine shows short segment of abnormal T2 signal at T7, th thoracic 7 to thoracic 8 vertebrae with surrounding edema. On axial imaging, there is an owl eye appearance. So what is the most likely diagnosis? So can anyone tell me the diagnosis here? Stand. Okay, let so she has so she has her uh, unable to stand follow uh, which was she had diarrhea and then she had uh, she is having ascending paralysis. Is it Gullian Bari? Okay, let, let's go for the exclusion. Can it be aortic dissection? No, the BP is normal, sir, 135 by something. And there is no history of chest pain. So in case of aortic dissection, the patient will have the severe tearing central chest pain and there should be a difference in blood pressure in the upper limb. Both the features are absent. So it can be the aortic dissection. Can it be epidural hematoma? Epidural so hematoma. No epidural of lucid interval. No, this is this is epidural hematoma. Epidural. Yes, this is epidural hematoma. Mm -hmm. the, the epidural hematoma. The epidural hematoma is usually seen following the epidural anesthesia or, or, or in case of lumbar train. So there okay. is no such history here. And the GBS. The GBS is seen, the patient with GBS, they typically comes up with the feature following the gastrointestinal uh, illness and they will also come with the features of ascending facet type of paralysis. Mm. But, but, but in case of Gullen Barry syndrome, there will be there will be slow onset of features like within weeks, not, not within three weeks. And also in case of Gullen Barry syndrome, the fine test joint position sensation. and vibration sensation mm -hmm. there will be there will be markedly diminished. So it can also be the Gullen Barry syndrome. And can it be transverse myelitis in case of transverse viral myelitis? Viral illness history or vaccination is... Yes, transverse mm -hmm. myelitis usually follows the HIV and the patient will have features of upper motor neural lesions. So patient will have increased tone and as well as that, there should be increased reflexes, hyperreflexia. So only one is left, that is the anterior spinal artery infraction and the short segment abnormal T2 signal with surrounding edema as well as the owl eye appearance are suggesting of the anterior spinal artery infraction. So anterior spinal artery infraction is a subtype under the anterior core syndrome. So patient will have sudden onset of acute painless placid bilateral lower limb weakness with diminished temperature sensation, hyporeflexion, decreased tone, preserved dorsal column function. So the dorsal column function would be preserved in case of anterior cord syndrome, but it won't be preserved in case of gullen barre syndrome and gullen barre syndrome will have a gradual, gradual onset, not the sudden onset. And patient, so patient will have the intact fine touch, joint position sense and vibration sense. With short segment lesion, with edema and also appearance on the MRI of the spine, points toward the anterior core syndrome. 
and anterior spinal artery infraction is the is one of the commonest cause of anterior core signal so since this patient is having the very sudden onset and the uh, and the dorsal column uh, dorsal column here is index so so it can be the cool and worry symptom so most likely diagnosis is the acute spinal artery infraction this patient has an acute onset of painless placid bilateral lower limb weakness and decreased reflexes and diminished temperature sensation but preserved dorsal column function this picture is consistent with anterior cord syndrome the most common cause of such presentation is anterior spinal artery infraction it is possible that the period of uh, diarrhea may have driven an increase in viscosity and be responsible for the arterial occlusion. The MRI findings of a short segment lesion with edema and corresponding aula appearance on axial imaging are classical of the spinal infraction. One would be able to reduce the anatomical location that is anterior central and posterior based on the imaging, which should allow further clinical correlation. While no specific treatment has proven benefit in this situation, antiplatelet therapy is commonly used. Aortic dissection will have the severe central chest tearing chest pain, and there should be differential BP in the arms, which is absent here. Epidural hematoma usually occur come with bilateral lower limb weakness in the post-operative patient, either receiving epidural anesthesia or having a lumbar training in situ. Golenberry syndrome is typically associated with ascending paralysis and this would be the ascending flaccid type of paralysis and it will affect the peripheral portion more compared to the central portion that develops over a number of days. So GBS will always have G for Golenberry, G for gradual onset. Golenberry syndrome is, will always have the gradual onset and the marked sensory defect would also be seen. The rapid onset of bilateral lower limb weakness is inconsistent with this as the underlying diagnosis and transverse myelitis is commonly seen following HIV and patient will come up with the features of upper motor neuron lesion or the lower motor. What is the most likely diagnosis? A. Dermatomyositis B. GPA, C, mixed connective tissue disease, D, SLE, E, systemic sclerosis. 42-year-old woman is referred to the rheumat clinic by the GP with dysphagia, reflux, esophagitis, Raynaud's phenomena and cutaneous ulcer on both of her shins. She also experienced a progressive decrease in the exercise tolerance over the last few months. On examination, BP 149 by 88, pulse 82 and regular examination of her hands revealed peripheral calcinosis and sclerodectyle. Examination of her face, microstomia and multiple telangiectasia. The autoantibody screen is positive for NTSCL70 antibodies. So features of crest is present here as well as progressive decrease in the exercise tolerance yes. and anti-SCL70 antibodies. So what is the alternative name for anti-SCL70? No, anti-SCL70 antibodies is also known as the anti toco isomerase 1. So features of crest, features of crest plus anti-ACL70 antibodies points towards the systemic sclerosis. Is this diffuse or is this cutaneous? The anti-centromere, anti-centromere is associated with the limited, no, anti-centromere is associated with limited, anti-ACL70 or topoisomerase is, is related to the diffuse cutaneous systemic sclerosis. And one of the predominant findings of diffuse cutaneous system sclerosis is the Raynaud's phenomena. So what is the treatment for Raynaud's phenomena? Calcium channel bro blocker. Yes, we should go with the calcium channel broker and the most commonly used is the nifedipine. And, and, and patient with, uh, patient with uh, system sclerosis often develops the scleroderma renal crisis when being treated with steroids. So what should be the choice of treatment for scleroderma renal crisis 
we should go with either AC inhibitor or ARBS. And in case of dermatomyositis, the patient will have the features of proximal myopathy. There should be heliotrope rash as well as the cotrons papule. And ANA is the most common antibody and anti-MI2 is the most specific. The GPA granulomatosis with polyangitis, also known as the Wegener's granulomatosis. This type of patient will have the features of renopulmonary syndrome. There should be renal impairment as well as features of pulmonary hemorrhage. The MCTD, the mixed connective tissue disorder. So all the features here can also be seen in case of mixed connective tissue disorder. The, but the mixed connective tissue disorder is associated with anti-UN RNP antibodies. And, and, and the patient with MCTD often has the features of photosensitive skin rash. And patient with ACL will also have the photosensitive rash, sparing the nasolabial fold with joint pain. And this ACL is associated with anti row or anti la This patient is exhibiting severe features of systemic sclerosis, in, uh, including peripheral carcinosis, sclerodactyly, microstomia, telangiectasia, renal spinovena, esophageal reflux. The positive anti HCL70 antibodies seen on the autoantibody screen adds further weight to this diagnosis. Renal spinovena is managed using the calcium channel blockers, most commonly the nifedipine. And when there is renal disease, it's primarily managed with angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitor. So, NC inhibitor is for the scleroderma renal crisis. Dermatomyositis will come with proximal myopathy, heliotrope rash, and Gottschall's specule. And ANA is the most common antibody. NTMI2 is the most specific. GPO will come with renopulmonary syndrome. MCTD will have anti UN RNP antibodies. And ACLU will have anti Rho or anti La as well as ANA or anti DSDNA or anti Smith antibody. Okay, next. What is the most appropriate next step in the patient's treatment? A. Commence digoxin, commence hevabredin, C. Commence spiro spironolactone, D. Substitute remipril with valsartan sec secubitril, E. Substitute bisoprolol with amlodipin. A 64-year male comes to the cardio clinic. He complains of shortness of breath on minimal exertion and can only climb the stairs once a day. He has suffered from anterior, anterior MI four years ago. He is treated with 8 mg bis, bisoprolol, 10 mg remipril, 40 mg forosemide for the cardiac failure. The BP is 135 by 85, pulse 72 and regular. Chest on auscultation is clear. There is minor pitting edema of both ankles. HB, TLC, platelet, sodium, potassium, all are normal with potassium slightly on the higher side, 5.1. Cretinine is 197 raised. Ejection fraction is only 30%. So what is the most appropriate next step? So this is the patient with <laughs> chronic cardiac <laughs> failure or chronic heart failure. Ejection fraction is 30%. Pulse or heart rate is 72 beats per minute. So what should be the most appropriate next step here? Can we use evobredin? Sir, what's the heart rate? Heart rate is 72 beats per minute. Yes, we can, sir. So management, drug management for chronic heart failures. The first line, all patients should receive both AC inhibitor and beta blocker. So A plus B in all the patient. Second line treatment are the aldosterone antagonist, like the spironolactone or the epidenone. And for the third line treatment, we need to go for the specialist review. And there is a long list of alternatives like evobredin, secovitril versatin, hydrolysin in combination with nitrate, desoxin, cardiac resynchronization therapy. And there is two strict criteria so for the evobredin. The sinus so rate of- Slightly change, sir. Now, after the second step, they prefer SGLT2 inhibitor. inhibitor. Yes, they, they, they have added the SGLT2 inhibitor as well after, after the second line treatment. 
So if a reading has a two strict criteria, one is the heart rate should be greater than 75 and ejection fraction should be less than 35%. And in case of sacubital versa tense, this is only related to low ejection fraction. There is nothing related to the heart rate. So if the heart rate is greater than 75, we go with the evaporating. If heart rate is less than 75, we should go with the psychobitril and pulsatin. And psychobitril pulsatin is considered in heart failure with reduced ejection fraction who are symptomatic on AC inhibitor or ARBs should be initiated following AC inhibitor or ARB washout period. And in Afro-Caribbean patient, go for hydrolyzing plus nitrate combination. And if there is any uh, any features of widened QRS complex, left bundle branch block or heart block, then we should go with cardiac resynchronization therapy. So there is two strict criteria to go with the evaporating. One is the heart test should be greater than 75 base per minute. Ejection fraction should be less than or equal to 35%. And if usually if the beta blocker is contraindicated and or not tolerable, or there if there is elevated ventricular rate, this by beta blocker. And in case of uh, aldosterone antagonists, they can be given if the ejection fraction is less than 55% here. So this patient is already getting the A plus B treatment. So we can go for the second line aldosterone antagonist, but since the patient is having the features of hyperkalemia and the potassium sparing diuretics will further list to hyperkalemia as well, so we can go with the spironolactone. And there are two strict criteria for evaporating. Ejection fraction should be less than 35. This is satisfying the criteria, but the heart rate here is less than 75. So we can also go with the evaporating. So we have only one option left, that is the substitute primary prelude. Versatine and psychobritin. And if here the heart rate was 76 beat per minute, then in that case we can easily go with the evaporating. This is an appropriate option in a patient with uncontrolled symptoms of heart failure. The patient is on maximum beta blockade with maximum dose of primary Therefore, it is appropriate to institute versatile and psychobritin given that the ejection fraction is below 35. And if you are breathing, the heart rate, resting heart rate should be at least 75 or greater than 75. And since this patient is already having the hyperkalemia, introduction of spinolactin will further list to hyperkalemia. So we can not also go with the mineralocorticoid receptor antagonists like spironolactone or epidurano. What is the most important investigation to conduct in this patient prior to switching medications? A. Chest X-ray B. Echo C. LF, uh, lung function test D. Thyroid function test E. Thiopurine methyl transferase activity A 34-year-old female Presents to Rheumat Clinic for the review. She has rheumatoid arthritis and plans to become pregnant in advance of trying for baby. The plan to switch her disease modifying anti rheumatic DMRD, anti rheumatic drug, to azathioprine. What is the most important investigation to conduct in this patient prior to switching? I think e everyone knows the answer. We should go with the TPMG. As a theoprine is metabolized to the active compound Marcaptopurin, a purine analog that inhibits purine synthesis. So in case of azathioprine, check the TPMT, thiopurine methyl transfer deficiency before treatment. So we should go with the TPMT activity. TPMT activity should be measured before commencing therapy with azathioprine. Patient with low TPMT activity, acumenous 6 mark during the metabolites of azathioprine. This significantly increases the risk of bone marrow toxicity in patient and may prompt use at a lower dose or avoidance of azathioprine altogether. Around 10% of patients have a low TPMT activity related to genetic polymorphism. And the methotrexate amiodarone, the ABM, amiodarone, bleomycin, methotrexate, they predominantly cause the predominant vaginal fibrosis. So we should go with the chest X-ray. 
the trastuzumab is the hard to receptor antagonist which causes the dilated cardiomyopathy or cardiac failure so we should go with the surveillance echocardiography the methotrexate also causes the lung fibrosis meaning the pulmonary fibrosis so go for lung function test amiodarone causes AIH amiodarone induced hypothyroidism and AIT amiodarone induced thyrotoxicosis so we should go with the thyroid function testing What is the most likely diagnosis? A. Anton Babinski syndrome, B. Charles Bonnet syndrome, C. Cotard syndrome, D. Frontotemporal dementia, E. Schizophrenia. 72-year-old man is brought to the ED by his daughter. He is unkept and has told the staff that he is dead. According to his daughter, he has hardly eaten for days, wakes up at 5 every morning and refuses to wash or change his clothes. He has experienced low mood since losing his job. He has believed that he has developed terminal cancer despite a number of normal investigations carried out by his GP. He now believes that he is dead. He refuses physical examination. What is the most likely diagnosis? Cotard? Yes, sir. <coughs> sorry. This is the case of Cotard syndrome. So, patient with Cotard syndrome, they, this is usually associated with severe depression, and patient have the nihilistic delusion where they believe that they are either dead or non-existent, or or a part of their limb is dead or missing. So, Cotard severe depression think of dead and the Anton Bamenski syndrome this usually occurs due to the inferior parietal lobe infraction and it should affect the non-dominant part can anyone tell me the uh, features of Charles Bonnet syndrome uh, sir patient has got some eye issue and he tries to fill he refuses that uh, he cannot see visual hallucination but uh... No psychosis, you know, no. Yes, no psychosis. Yes, he <laughs> is aware that he has a problem, sir, but then he doesn't want to accept that he is blind. He cannot see with his eye. Yes, very good. So patient with Charles Bonnet syndrome experience persistent or recurrent complex visual or auditory hallucination, however, generally have full insight into their condition. So they will have the intact insight. The ARMD is related macular degeneration is associated with the Charles Bonnet syndrome and choice of treatment should be the reassurance. And what should be the findings in case of frontotemporal dementia, FTD? Uh, personality mm -hmm. changes and uh, irrelevant behavior. Disinhibition. Disinhibition, yeah. Yes. Sexual disinhibition. There should be bizarre pattern of behavioral changes, including sexual disinhibition. Often with repetitive checking, binge eating, and often they give the history of professional footballer, like the header. MRI will show frontal and temporal atrophy and PET scan will show frontal hypoperfusion. Most likely diagnosis is the frontotemporal dementia. Choice of treatment is SSRI. Among the SSRI, we commonly go with paroxetinol, fluoxetin. So frontotemporal dementia will have atrophy in the frontal lobe and the Alzheimer's dementia, which is the most common cause of dementia, will have the diffuse cerebral atrophy. And the second most common cause of dementia is the frontotemporal dementia. And Leo body dementia is, is seen in case of Parkinsonism patient. This is known as the Parkinson's plus syndrome. Patient will have the visual hallucination. hallucination. And multi infer dementia will have stepwise deterioration in the cognitive impairment with significant vascular event or cardiovascular risk factors. And acute schizophrenia will have the thought disorder like thought broadcasting 
or thought insertion. Coated syndrome usually occurs in patients who are depressed and who develop an, uh, an unshakable delusion that they have died. This patient's symptoms began when he lost his job and has have steadily progressed to the point of psychotic delusion of mortality. Patient with Cotter syndrome respond very well to electroconvulsive therapy, making this a form of depression where intervention could be considered proslide. Anton Babinski syndrome develops as a result of demonstrated non-dominant inferior parietal lobe. So parietal lobe, inferior portion, non-dominant. Symptoms include controlateral sensory neglect, anognoxia with association with anox diaphoria and construction and dressing apraxia. Charles Bonnet syndrome occurs in patients with severe visual impairment. Patients suffer from quite complex visual hallucination, particularly in areas of low light and most often at the beginning and at the end of the day because, it, because during this time zone there will be low light so patient can see properly. And patient, uh, many patients with a complex geometric pattern. Frontotemporal dementia is associated with prominent mood changes, inappropriate behavior early in the disease progression. Speech and language changes are also seen. They, this may include primary progressive aphasia, semantic dementia, and progressive agrammatic aphasia. Some antidepressant agents like triazotone as well as the uh, paracetine or fluoxetine may be useful in the management of frontotemporal dementia. And acute schizophrenia will have throat broadcasting, throat insertion, primary delusional perception, and respiratory or olanzapine. This group of atypical antipsychotics are the Proslin choice of drugs. What is the most appropriate intervention? A. Increase fluticasone and itraconazole. B. Itraconazole. Uh, C. Omalizumab. D. Prednisolone and itraconazole. E. Prednisolone. Twenty-nine-year-old female presents to respi clinic with worsening of asthma, despite taking fluticasone, serivant, and montelukast. She is still suffering from wheezes nearly every day, intermittent fever, and hemoptosis. On examination, temperature thirty-seven point two, BP is one twenty-one by eighty, pulse seventy-eight, and regular. There is bilateral wheeze on auscultation. Uh, HB 13.1, TLC 11.9, eosinophilia is there 2.9, platelet 2,72, sodium 144, potassium 4.8, creatinine 107, CRP 28, aspergillus skin test is positive, chest x-ray shows patchy infiltration, interstitial infiltrates and serum IgE level is raised 1. 1560. So this patient is having the features of worsening asthma with elevated <laughs> eosinophilia. And worsening asthma plus elevated use uh, plus elevated eosinophilia count has predominantly two differential diagnoses. Number one is the eosinophilic granulomatosis with polyangitis, EGPA, also known as the CSS. And number two is the ABP. And in case of CSS, will get the features of mononeuritis and in case of ABPA there should be no features of mononeuritis or vasculitis and asper aspergillus skin test would be positive and chest test will show the patchy interstitial infiltrate and serum IG level would be significantly elevated. So this is a case of allergic bronchopulmonary aspergillosis. So what is the first line choice of drug for ABPA? Uh, should we go should we so they are asking about Eastern the most is right. they have was reverting the most appropriate intervention yeah. not the first line intervention so the most appropriate should intervention be. should be combination of both oral prednisolone and oral mm -hmm. antifungal itraconazole and if the patient does not respond to this prednisolone itraconazole therapy then we can move on to the omalizumab since omalizumab is the choice of treatment in case of severe asthma with significant elevation of IgE and, and severe asthma plus significant elevation of eosinophil is the indication for mepolizumab. And mepolizumab is the interleukin 5 monoclonal antibody. So, first, so the most appropriate choice of treatment here should be combination of oral prednisolone and itraconazole 
but if they has us regarding what should be the next step or what should be the first and choice of that then the answer would be only the prednisolone Prednisolone and itraconazole in combination are the intervention of choice for ABPA, the likely diagnosis here. In a patient with worsening asthma, in particularly in the presence of fever and intermittent hemoprisis, ABPA is a possibility. Elevated eosinophil, a positive skin test for aspergillus, the uh, passage changes on the chest x-ray, are further pointers to this diagnosis. Patient who failed to respond to the dual oral combination, omalizumab can be given. Prednisolone alone is unlikely to resolve the symptoms of ABPA. The additions of itraconazole significantly improves the resolution of symptoms over the long term as a result of its both antifungal and anti-inflammatory properties. What is the most likely causative pathogen in this patient? A. Mycobacterium TB, B. Propinobacterium acinus, C. Salmonella typhi, D. Streptococcus pyogen, E. Streptococcus aureus. 73 year old female presence in rheumat clinic complaining of constant pain and stiffness in her right hip. 13 months ago, she underwent a right total hip replacement. X-ray is suggestive of some reabsorption of bone around the femoral head prosthesis. CRP is chronically elevated at around 40. You suspect a late presenting prosthetic joint infection. So which organism is most common in, in late presenting prosthetic joint Rupani infection? Bacteria. Yes. Yes, very good. It's the Propionibacterium acne. So, lead presenting prosthetic joint infection, most likely organism is the Propionibacterium acne. And this is also the organism for the acne vulgaris. Propionibacterium acne, now known as QT bacterium, is a well recognized cause of less presenting prosthetic joint infection. It is thought that more frequent emissions of propionibacterium acne infection are seen in obese patients who undergo hip replacement due to carriers of the pathogen on the skin of the groin. Propionibacterium acne is highly susceptible to treatment with penicillin, clindamycin, cephalosporin, and carbapenem. Joint aspiration is the most appropriate next step. A removal of the prosthesis and replacement at a later date may be required to achieve total clearance of the bacterium. And aureus, aureus is related to the early prosthetic joint infection, aureus and the epidermidis. Both, so staph aureus and epidermis, both. So if, if, if the duration is within two months, the most common is the epidermidis, but aureus can also happen. But if you go for the comparison within first two months, the epidermidis is more likely, but, but aureus can also happen. If, if, if you have both, of, both in the option, aureus and epidermidis, then choose the epidermidis. If epidermidis is not in the option, you can choose the aureus. Okay, sir. Okay, next one. What is the most appropriate dose as required morphine to prescribe in this patient? 5 mg up to 6 times per day, 10 mg up to 6 times per day, 20 mg up to 6 times per day, 20 mg up to 4 times per day, 30 mg up to 4 times per day. A 54-year-old woman presents to Onco Clinic as she is expecting experiencing breakthrough pain affecting her left femur. She is taking 60 mg slow release morphine twice daily as well as naproxen and paracetamol for pain for bony meds related to breast cancer. So what is the appropriate dose of required morphine? So calculate the breakthrough dosing here. Breakthrough dosing is one sixth of the total daily dose. Okay. So total daily dose is 16 to 120. So 120 divided by 6 is probably 20. And since we are, since we are dividing with 6, 
So we can give it six times per day. So 20 milligram up to six times per day. So breakthrough dose is one sixth of the daily total dose per 24 hour. We should divide the total dose by six. And after dividing, that dose can be divided every six times per day, every four hours. Immediate release morphine at 20 milligram up to six times per day is the appropriate breakthrough dose. For this patient, the breakthrough dose is usually calculated by dividing the total daily dose by six. In this case, 60 milligram of morphine twice a day equals the total daily dose of 120 milligram. Okay. What is the most appropriate intervention in this patient? A. Acetylzolamide, B. Furosemide, C. Prednisolone, D. Shunt insertion, E. Topiramide, Topiramide, Topiramide. 29 year old female is admitted to ED with severe headache, which is worsening, which is worse in the morning on lying down and when she strains. She reports that the headache is dull in nature and has got gradually worse over the past few months. Over the last week, she has experienced a graying of her vision when straining. On examination, her BP is 155 by 90, pulse is 85 and regular. She has bilateral papilloedema on fundoscopy. Her visual fields are normal on confrontation and equity is 6 by 9. Corrected bilaterally. She is obese with BMI of 34. Everything is normal. The, just the CSF opening pressure is 27, which is raised. The MRI of her brain is as shown. So MRI of the brain is almost looking like normal here. So go for the scenario. What may be the most likely diagnosis here? It has already been discussed. Idiopathic yes. intracranial hypertension. Very good. This is the case of idiopathic intracranial hypertension and weight reduction is the mainstay of treatment. Along with weight reduction, we can also go with the acetylcholamide, carbonic anhydrase inhibitor. And if the patient does not respond to pharmacological therapy, we can go with the shunt insertion as mm -hmm. a part of intervention. Can you please show the CT? What is showing on the CT? Is the MRI. Okay, MRI. What is showing? The MRI is, is look, almost looking like normal here. I am not finding okay. any pathology here. It's a normal. It's a normal MRI. And 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 usually usually patient with idiopathic intracranial hypertension they usually have the normal MRI and 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 in few cases there will be enlargement of the ventricles but here the ventricles are normal. This patient is suffering from chronic headache and visual disturbance with papilledema taken in conjunction with her elevated opening CSF pressure. Normal MRI scan and obviously the most likely diagnosis is IIH. Well, uh, one uh, important differential is to exclude the venous sinus thrombosis. This can be acid via appropriate venous imaging. Carbonic anhydrase inhibitors such as acetazolamide reduce the ra rate of CSF production. And the uh, acetazolamide has side effects like paresthesia, anorexia, malice, metallic taste in the mouth, and mild acidosis. So can anyone tell me the management of uh, sagittal sinus thrombosis or cerebral venous sinus thrombosis? treatment we should go with a low molecular weight heparin and in some cases the frosamide can also be given if the loop diuretics is not tolerated but this is for just for the theoretical purpose this is never used practically and if the patient does not respond to the medical that is the pharmacological therapy then shunt insertion may be generally considered What is the most likely diagnosis? A. Fat embolism. B. Hemorrhagic pulmonary edema. C. Hospital acquired 
pneumonia, D pulmonary embolism, E pulmonary vasculitis. A 45 year old man in comes in emergency depart, uh, department with deteriorate who has deteriorated rapidly following extubation. He has been intubated and ventilated for a period after acute pancreatitis and the development of ARDS. He is obese and has type 2 diabetes. On examination, BP 142 by 84, pulse 110. There are extensive crackles on auscultation of the chest. Suction reveals blood-stained fluid. His oxygen saturation is 92 on 10 liters O2 and portable chest x-ray shows extensive patchy consolidation which is much worse than seen on the pre-extubation three days. Again, the patient has gone into ARDS, sir. Yeah. The Pulmonary edema. So basically the, basically the patient was on intubation and ventilation for the acute pancreatitis and the AID is developed as a result of this acute pancreatitis as a part of acute complication. And following the extubation, the patient deteriorated further. There was more extensive crackles, more reduction in the oxygen saturation and with extensive passive consolidation. So the, so the features of deterioration has occurred following the Extubation. So, what may be the most likely diagnosis here? Can it be pulmonary vasculitis? No. So, B. Hemorrhagic pulmonary edema. Yes, very good. This is a case of hemorrhagic pulmonary edema, HPO. So, history of rapid deterioration with extubation with history, with prior history of intubation and ventilation, usually in the obese patient, having features of hypoxia, pulmonary edema, and pulmonary hemorrhage, points towards the hemorrhagic pulmonary edema. And the laryngospasm is the underlying pathophysiology, and the urgent anesthetic specialist intervention should be introduced. Hemorrhagic pulmonary edema is a well-described potential consequence of intubation seen in patients who are obese, and whose airway is obstructed. Rapid deterioration is seen so, uh, soon after extubation, characterized by hypoxia, pulmonary edema, and pulmonary hemorrhage. So patient will have history of intubation and ventilation, and there should be rapid deterioration following extubation, and usually this is characterized by hypoxia, pulmonary edema, and pulmonary hemorrhage, and laryngospasm is the underlying pathophysiology. And fat embolism is usually seen following the fracture of the long bone. What is the most useful next investigation for this patient? A. MRI brain. B. Morning urinary sodium and potassium. C. Renal tract ultrasound. D. Serum. ADH measurement, E, water depriva deprivation test. A 43-year-old woman presents to the nephro clinic complaining of polyuria and polydipsia. She has been cons feeling constantly thirsty. She has been taking lithium carbonate for the past four days to treat long-standing bipolar disorder. On examination, BP is 104 by 82, pulse is 88. She has a postural drop of 10 mm of mercury on standing. All the investigations are normal sodium is all sodium is slightly on the higher side, 146. Rest and creatinine is 132. So this patient is having the features of diabetes, insipid, diabetes like polyuria, polydipsia with long history of taking lithium carbonate with postural drop and high normal sodium. So this points towards the lithium induced nephrogenic diabetes insipidus. So in order to establish the nephrogenic diabetes insipidus, what should be the most appropriate next step? Uh, 
water deprivation test yes very good we should go with the water deprivation test so so what should be the findings in water deprivation test in nephrogenic di uh, so initially no improvement. In Initially, in case of diabetes insipidus, the urinary osmolarity should be low. So urine goes down, so urine osmolarity should be low. And the plasma, plasma osmolarity, P for plasma, P for peak. So plasma osmolarity would be peak in, in, in case of diabetes insipidus. And, and you know, in order to differentiate between cranial and nephrogenic, we need to go with the water deprivation test. And in case of nephrogenic diabetes insipidus, the water deprivation test will fail to increase the urine osmolarity. The urine osmolarity should remain less than 300 even after the post-TDAVP. But in case of cranial diabetes insipidus, it should be at least double or greater than 600. So can anyone tell me the treatment for nephrogenic DI? Step 1, step 2 and step 3. Desmopressin? No, not the okay. desmopressin. So step one should be low solute diet. And step two should be thiazide diuretics. And usually we go with the traditional thiazide diuretics, like bendrofluoromethiazide. And third step should be enzymes. And among the enzymes, endomethacin is more commonly used compared to naproxen. So step one, low solute diet. Step two, low solute diet plus thiazide diuretics, bendrofluoromethiazide. Step 3, low solute diet plus pentochloromethazide plus endomethacin. This patient has been taking lithium over the long term. The sodium is just above the upper limit of normal and she experienced a small postural drop on blood pressure on standing. This raises the possibility of nephrogenic diabetes insipidus. A water deprivation test would be investigation of choice here. A urine osmolarity of less than 300 milliospel per kg, which fails to concentrate after internal nasal desmopressin, is consistent with the nephrogenic DI. And substituting lithium for another more stabilizer would be the most appropriate initial intervention. Combination therapy comprising the uh, thiazide enzymes may then drive the urine concentration. What is the most likely diagnosis? Penis, penisciasis, capillariasis, C. cutaneous leishmaniasis, D. diarophiliasis, E. diarcunculiasis. Okay. A 24-year-old man presents to the derma clinic with blistering lesion on the lower limb. He has just returned a trip from Cameroon. A worm is in identified and removed as shown below. So blistering lesion with history of returning from trip to Cameroon and worm has been identified and they have just given the pictorial here. Okay, let's go for the answer. Dracunculiasis, also known as kidney or infection, is caused by a Dracunculus medinensis. Infection is transmitted by consumption of unfiltered water containing small uh, crustaceans infected with the larva. An extensive WHO program has eradicated the disease in several countries, although cases still may be seen in many West African countries. So, this West African countries was actually a flu here. The own lie under the superficial blister like lesion and the tract formed by own can be identified under the skin. An incision is usually made and the worm is on slowly around a stick to remove it from the subcutaneous space. So they have given here a picture of a mastic. Mastic here with the camera or, or also, also the, the West African countries. So this is the trachuncoliasis, also known as the guinea worm infection.
what is the most appropriateness investigation a abdominal usg b abdominal x-ray c colonoscopy d flexible sigmoidoscopy e stool culture a 29 year old man is admitted to ed with abdominal pain and distension he has hardly eaten for past 48 hours due to nausea and has opened his bowel between 6 to 8 times per day for the past few days. He has experienced bloody diarrhea and mucus. His symptoms are usually controlled with mesalazine, although he began a course of prednisolone four days ago. On examination, temperature 37.9, BP 100 by 70, pulse 98 and regular. Abdomen is generally tender and moderately descended with active bowel sounds. Hemoglobin 9.1, TLC raise 16.1, platelet and sodium normal, potassium slightly lower 3.4, creatinine on the higher end 139 and CRP is raised 212. So most probably this is the patient with ulcerative hip colitis and patient's CRP has been significantly elevated pointing towards the acute flare or active flare of the ulcerative colitis and based on the true love and weights criteria if the opening of the bowel is greater or equal to 6 then this indicates the severe or the, fal or the, or the fulminant ulcerative colitis and that severe or fulminant ulcerative colitis has significant chance of developing the toxic megachrome. So in order to diagnose the toxic megachrome what should be the next investigation? we can go with the abdominal x-ray and once toxic megacolon diagnosis is confirmed the IV cyclosporine should be the first line choice of treatment followed by colectomy. Plain abdominal x-ray is the investigation of choice here. It is essential to rule out the presence of toxic megacolon in patient with severe exacerbation of ulcerative colitis evidence there by the presence of six or more stool a day with blood and systemic outset. The diagnosis of ulcerative colitis is clear here with blood in the stool and use of mesalazine pointing away from Crohn's disease. In toxic megacolon, the transverse or the right colon is usually most dilated and is frequently greater than 6 cm and occasionally up to 15 cm on the supine films. The descending colon is less frequently dilated and the sig uh, sigmoid colon and rectum is rarely distended. Toxic megacolon as a result of an uh, exacerbation of this patient uh, ulcerative colitis is a major concern here. All the abdominal ultrasound scanning can be useful when evaluating the bowel wall thickness. Plain abdominal X is a quicker response. A stool culture is usually done when there is diagnostic confusion between whether this is infectious diarrhea or inflammatory disease. What is the most likely cause of barium solo appearance? A. Eclexia, B. Esophageal carcinoma, E. Esophageal diverticulum, e, D. Esophageal varices, E. Reflux esophagitis. Seventy-two-year-old man presents to gastro clinic to discuss his barium solo result. He has suffered from progressive dysphagia initially to solids and now to liquids. Blood tests have revealed iron deficiency anemia and elevated trans MNIs. The barium solo is as shown below. So progressive dysphagia affecting both solid and liquid from the beginning indicates achalasia cardia. Progressive dysphagia initially to solid followed by liquids points towards underlying cancer. Progressive dysphagia initially to liquid followed by solid indicates the neuromuscular disorder. So this progressive dysphagia initially to solid is pointing towards the underlying cancer. And this unexplained iron deficiency anemia, elevated transaminase, and the old days of the patient are also suggestive of the underlying cancer. And if we look at the barium swallow uh, x-ray here, 
and there is a bird beak appearance and there is the irregular filling defect here so bird beak appearance with irregular filling defects points towards the underlying esophageal cancer and in case of achalasia cardia patient will have progressive dysphagia to both solid and liquid patient won't have iron deficiency anymore or elevated transaminase and the patient will also have the bars big appearance but the here the along this zone there should be regular and it will looks like a funnel shape not not this type of a irregular filling defect progressive dysphagia with iron deficiency anemia coupled with bird big tapering on barium surely raises the possibility of the esophageal cancer the irregular appearance of the esophagus below the taper fits with the diagnosis and endoscopy to biopsy and assess the suitability for stenting is the logical next step. Given the extent of the lesion, it is already likely to have metastasis. So achalasia will have a progressive dysphagia to both solid and liquid food particles from the beginning. They will have the burst peak appearance, but usually they will have the smooth below the taper, not the irregular filling defect. And esophageal varices will come with features of decompensated CLD or portal hypertension with, uh, with uh, upper GI bleeding. Reflux esophagitis. Reflux esophagitis will lead to GERD. GERD will lead to Barrett's esophagus. And Barrett's esophagus will lead to the esophageal adenocarcinoma. What is the most likely diagnosis? A. Cushing syndrome. B. Hypothyroidism. C. Polymyalgia rheumatica. D. Polymyositis. And E. Is rheumatoid arthritis. A 74 year woman presents to musculoskeletal clinic complaining of severe stiffness and pain, which affects her shoulder and hips for the first few hours every morning. It often lasts her two to three hours to get downstairs for breakfast. The pain persists despite maximal dose ibuprofen and paracetamol. On examination, the BP is 167 by 95, pulse is 73 and regular. His BMI is 23. All the investigations are normal except ESR, which is 85. Proximal joint stiffness. Polymyalgia rheumatic cause. Yes, very good. So the proximal joint stiffness is one of the predominant features in case of PMR. And PMR usually follows the ACR criteria of 50 by 50. Age of the patient should be greater than 50. And the ESR should be greater than 50. So this is a case of polymyalgia rheumatic. So what should be the choice of treatment for polymyalgia rheumatic? Dose of steroid? 60 mg. That is high, sir, if we are suspecting temporal. Okay. So in case of polymyalgia rheumatic, usually we go with the low dose prednisolone, 15 milligram. And according to some other guidelines, they just say start with 20.5 milligram followed by 25 milligram. But as a cutoff value, we can remember the PMR should be treated with 15 milligram and in case of temporal arteritis or giant cell arteritis if there is no features of impending visual loss we can go with 60 milligram prednisolone and if uh, temporal arteritis or gc is associated with features of impending visual loss then we should go with the iv methyl prednisolone this patient has a normal weight, calcium and creatine level with a marked elevation in the ESR. Considering the proximal myopathy, morning stiffness, PMR is the most likely diagnosis. Oral prednisolone is the intervention of choice and 12.5 mg. So in, so in some guidelines, they, they start with 15 mg. In some cases, they start with 12.5, then increasing up to 25. Cushing syndrome will also, is associated with proximal myopathy, but patient don't follow the 50 by 50 rule and patient will also have weight gain and other uh, metabolic abnormalities. Hypothyroidism will have the thyroid hormone abnormalities. Polymyositis can result in painful and proximal myopathy, but patient will have 
significant elevation in the pH in in kinase. Okay, go on. What is the most likely diagnosis? A. Alport syndrome, B. Bilateral renal artery thrombosis, C. Left renal adenocarcinoma, B. Medullary sponge kidney, E. Transitional cell carcinoma of the bladder. Sixty-eight-year-old woman is referred to the nephro nephroclinic by her GP for investigation of chronic renal impairment. Her creatinine is progressively increasing from one thirty micromole per liter six months ago to two hundred five on the latest measurement. Her GP has also noticed. Hematuria on two occasions over the last three months. On examination, her BP is 149 by 85, pulse 80 and regular. Her abdomen is soft and is tender in suprapubic region with a palpable mass. Hemoglobin 9, WBC 10.2, platelets and sodium is normal, potassium 5.4, creatinine 205. The CT scan of her abdomen with contrast is as shown below. So the ureter, ureter is dilated here. Dilated. Ureter is dilated here as well as that there is enlargement of the kidney. Most probably this patient has the hydronephrosis. So hydronephrosis along with recurrent hematuria, palpable bladder, so what may be the most likely diagnosis? So based on the NICE guideline, NICE guideline if the age of the patient is greater than 55 and if the patient comes up with the features of recurrent hematuria, then we should always exclude the transitional cell carcinoma. And patient with transitional cell carcinoma often develops the bilateral hydronephrosis. So most likely this patient has the underlying transitional cell carcinoma of the blood. But before that, let me show you some picture here related to the bilateral hydronephrosis. The patient will have the enlarged uterus and the and the kidney will be enlarged elsewhere. So the ureter is enlarged here, enlarged. There should be enlarged uterus, oh, sorry, not the enlarged, there should be dilated u u ureter and there should be enlarged kidney. Dilated dilated and enlarged. The CT scan here shows bilateral hydronephrosis with dilated ureter seen on the CT slice coupled with the hematuria and progressive increase in serum creatinine is consistent with the diagnosis of the transitional cell carcinoma of the bladder. It is likely that underlying cancer can be visualized on more distal CT scan slices Bilateral nephrost uh, nephrostomies to relieve the obstruction is likely to be required. So age of the patient greater than 55, coming up with recurrent hematuria, always go for the screening for transitional cell carcinoma. And transitional cell carcinoma is often associated with bilateral hydronephrosis. What is the most important component of therapeutic drug monitoring in this patient? 
A regular chest X-ray, B regular echo, C regular lung function test, D regular LFT, E regular WBC, including neutrophil differential. A 72-year-old man is reviewed in the movement disorder clinic as she has begun experiencing psychotic episodes. He believes that there are people in the house who are threatening him. He has been violent towards his wife during these episodes. He has end-stage Parkinson's disease and has been commenced on colazepine. What is the most important therapeutic drug monitoring in this patient? So what is, the, what is the most common side effect of close-up? Anyone else? What is the most common side effects of close-up in therapy? Go on, Granulocytosis. Sorry? Uh, granulocytosis. Yes, the, the close-up end causes the neutropenia. So close-up end causes the neutropenia. For this reason, there should be intensive monitoring for the white cell count and as well as the absolute neutrophil count. And the monitoring should be first, first 18 weeks of treatment and after 18 weeks of treatment, after every four weeks interval, and it, this monitoring should be continued throughout the treatment and up to four weeks after complete this continuation of the close-up. So since it causes neutropenia, we should go for intense monitoring for the white cell count as well as the absolute neutrophil count. And for this reason, the close-up is often avoided in a patient with instance Parkinson's disease. And actually, this is a case of body dementia. Neutrophenia. Neutrophenia is a key adverse effect of a close-up in therapy and is su subject of a bl uh, black box on the medication level. For this reason, intensive monitoring of white cell count and neutrophil count is mandated for all people in whom it is prescribed. Close-up should only be pre prescribed in patients who have WCC and neutrophil count above the lower limit of normal range. A regular white cell count and absolute neutrophil count should be performed weekly for the first 18 weeks of treatment. And at four weeks interval thereafter, monitoring must continue throughout the treatment and for four weeks after complete discontinuation. Method exit, amyogenon, leomycin, causes pulmonary fibrosis. So monitor with the help of chest X-ray. Trastosome causes DCM, monitor with early echocardiography. Amyogenon, leomycin, causes pulmonary fibrosis, so also go with lung function test. At the method to exit, statin, MEO joint, they also causes the abnormal liver function test. So go for liver function test monitoring. So doctor, are you tired of reading the question? So can anyone this take over instead of her? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Can anyone else? There are three others. Anyone from Dr. Kartik or Dr. Sabina or Dr. May? Okay, I will do. Okay, please continue. Go on. Go on. Uh, what is the most likely cause of the episode of VT seen in this patient? Accord uh, long long QT syndrome, Brugoda syndrome, Margaret ischemia, pacemaker lead displacement under under sensing of our atrial and ventricular signals. Uh, a 70 year old woman is admitted to the emergency department following a collapse. Upon arrival, she underwent an episode of ventricular taking for which she received a 150 a shock. She had an aortic valve replacement 12 years ago and a pacemaker was fitted afterwards for impaired to particular nodal conduction. On arrival in the unit, she has a sore chest, but she is uh, conscious and oriented. On examination, her blood pressure is 140 to 82, um, pulse 64, 5. Uh, her chest is clear. Her blood are unremarkable. So, what's the cause of episode of VT? 
So patient has a history of aortic valve replacement, 12 years ago, and as well as the pacemaker in uh, yeah, pacemaker insertion for this impaired AV nodal conduction. And, and on the accident emergency department, patient that comes with the features of VT and treated with 150 joule shock. So what is the most likely cause of episodes of VT? Can it be acquired long QT syndrome? Acquired long QT syndrome will have the long QT interval. And this is often this often occurs following the drug therapy like either erythromycin, erythromycin or the sotalol. But but those history are absent here. And also the there is no mentioning regarding the QT interval. So can anyone tell me the ECG findings in Brugada syndrome? Brugada syndrome will have the J point elevation. So what does J point elevation mean in case of Brugada syndrome? Brugada syndrome will come with the right bundle branch block and there will be J point elevation or J wave elevation. And J wave elevation means there should be ST elevation greater or equal to 2 millimeter in the lead, lead V1 and V3. And we have three types of Brugada syndrome, type 1, type 2, type 3. In all cases, we will get the J-wave amplitude, but the T-wave will determine whether this is type 1, type 2, or type 3. If the T-wave is negative, negative deflection going towards down, this indicates type 1. If this is positive, then type 3. And in case of type 2, it may be either negative or positive. So in Brugada syndrome type 1, there should be ST segment elevation greater or equal to 2 millimeter in the late, late, V1 to V3 known as the J point elevation followed by negative T. So also this can be the Brugada syndrome as well. And in case of myocardial infarction, patient will have the history of the chest pain. Patient has the uh, sore chest pain. Sore chest does not indicate the type of chest pain in case of myocardial ischemia. And pacemaker lead displacement. No pacemaker lead displacement can only occur in case of temporary pacemaker. The but the patient is having the permanent pacemaker. So we have only one option left. That is the under sensing of the atrial and ventricular signal. So pacemaker induced ventricular tachycardia, this leads to the ectopic ventricular complexes, which is responsible for under sensing of the atrial, atrial ventricular signal. So this patient already has the pacemaker and this pacemaker has induced the ventricular tachycardia and which has given rise to the ectopic ventricular complex leading to under sensing of the atrial and ventricular signals. And this pacemaker induced ventricular tachycardia can be avoided by introducing a pacemaker which includes an atrial demand pacing rate. Ventricular tachycardia can be dry, driven in a patient with pacemaker in the presence of ectopic ventricular complexes under sensing of the ventricular which drives the devil, delivery of the ventricular pacing stimulus. When this occurs at the wrong time, it can deliver a stimulus that precipitates VT. Pacemaker induced VT can be avoided by introducing a pacemaker which includes an atrial demand pacing. Long QT syndrome will have the prolonged QT interval and often associated with drugs like claritromycin, elytromycin, sotalol or the antifungal fluconazole and itraclonazole. And patient with long QT syndrome may ultimately develop the torsus T pointers VT. And torsus T point test should be treated with IV magnesium 1.2 to 2 mg every 20 minutes. And Brugada syndrome will have the J point elevation in lead V1 to V3. Myocardial ischemia will have the central chest pain. And pacemaker lead displacement can only occur in case of temporary pacing here. This can occur in permanent pacemaker insertion. Okay, next one. Uh, what is the most likely diagnosis? Alcoholic cirrhosis, autoimmune hepatitis, hepatocellular carcinoma, hydatid disease, non-alcoholic stereohepatitis. A 73-year-old man referred to hepatology clinic by GP after presenting with tiredness and lethargy seven months ago, coupled with abnormal liver function test. He admits that he goes to the pub for lunch every day and drinks whiskey every evening. He has done so since the death of his wife from cancer five years ago. 
He smokes 10 cigarettes per day. On examination, his abdomen is soft. There is mild tenderness in the right upper quadrant. He note multiple respirator navy on his upper body. His body mass index is 22. Hemoglobin 109, WBC normal, platelet 110. Low, sodium normal, potassium normal, creatinine normal, uh, um, ALT 93, AST 202, LP 152. Bilirubin 15, A anti smooth muscle antibody negative. The ultrasound scan is shown below. So there is hypertrophy of the clouded lobe and the echogenicity has been distorted here. And if we look at the other parameters here, so this is the old patient having features of abnormal liver function test, significant history of taking the alcohol with multiple spider navy and significant elevation in the transaminase and with anti smooth muscle antibody negativity this is excluding the ais and based on this ultrasound picture most likely this is the case of liver cirrhosis dr ahad can you please explain the ultrasound again uh, and compare with the normal one yeah i am showing it So look at the echogenicity here. The echogenicity here is normal and, uh, uh, as well as the pile duct and lobules, all of them are visible. And here the echogenicity has been distorted. You you can differentiate between them. Let me show you what. Yes. So also look at here. The echogenicity has been distorted here. And this is the normal one. This is the normal, and this is the cirrhotic liver, liver cirrhosis. There is destruction in the echogenicity. So this is the normal fatty this is the normal liver. This is the fatty liver. There is increase in echogenicity in this portion. And this is the cirrhotic liver, something something looking like a distorted picture distorted echogenicity. Is that clear or I need to show more? Yeah, yeah, no, it's okay. okay. Yeah, thank you. Okay, look at here. The, 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 the echogenicity is being distorted here and, and this is the coded tube. The coded tube should be somewhat like this size, but there has been significant increase in the coded tube. It should be something like this size, but there is a significant hypertrophy here. Okay. This patient has a blood picture, so it's type of alcohol-related liver disease. So let's go for the ALT to AST ratio. We have missed out. So ALT. So AST versus ALT ratio this is greater than two, which is the classical findings in case of alcoholic liver disease. And in case of alcoholic liver disease, the ALP would be mildly elevated. With elevated transaminase and LP anemia with low platelet and abnormal liver ultrasound scan, the US scan here shows hypertrophy of the powdered loop and coarse liver texture consistent with cirrhosis. The alcohol history and relatively low BMI are pointers towards alcoholic liver disease than non alcoholic steatohepatitis. Prothrombin time should be measured and the patient should undergo a liver biopsy to assess the degree of cirrhosis. In addition, he should be encouraged to reduce his alcohol consumption. And autoimmune hepatitis will have the asthma positivity. And in case of hepatocellular carcinoma, this will come with a nodular shape and there will be hypoechogenicity. That means it will look more like whitish color, not the blackish color. Cirrhosis, cirrhosis will come with the blackish color and the hepatocellular carcinoma will come with the whitish color.
Um, what is the most appropriate treatment option for this patient? I am set triaxone 500 milligram single dose. I am set triaxone one gram single dose and oral azithromycin one gram per week for 14 days. I am set triaxone one gram single dose plus 14 days doxycycline 100 milligram twice a day and 14 days metronidazole 400 milligram twice a day. Oral doxycycline 100 milligram twice a day for 14 days or oral moxifloxacin. 400 milligram twice a day for 14 days. A 29 year old woman present to the urgent gynecology clinic complaining of pain during sexual intercourse on deep penetration. She also experienced intermittent bilateral lower abdominal pain and bleeding on some occasion following sexual intercourse. On examination, her temperature is 37.8. Bimanual vaginal examination reveals adenexial. Tenderness while speculum examination reveals mucoprolent cervical discharge. Uh, NAT for amida is positive. So there is pain. Dramide. on. So can you tell me the diagnosis here? This is it chlamydia. Is, yeah. So pain. NAT positive. Chlamydia. Pain during sexual intercourse on deep penetration as well as lower abdominal pain and as well as the bleeding. And initial tenderness, mucoporal and cervical disease. So this is this is a case of pelvic inflammatory disease. Yes, very good. This is a case of pelvic inflammatory disease. So what should be the choice of treatment in PID? Safe track zone. So PID should be treated. There are there, there are two modalities of treatment. One is AMO, and another one is the DMC. Just remember, medical officer of the Dhaka Medical College. So DMC means doxycycline, metronidazole, and cetriaxone. And AMO medical officer means metronidazole and ofloxacin. So medical officer of Dhaka Medical College. So here, look here. So we are getting the DMC. DMC here. So we should go with the DMC. So I am safe to action one gram single dose plus uh, 14 days doxycycline 100 milligram twice a day and 14 days metronidazole 400 milligram twice a day. This is the preferred combination treatment for pelvic inflammatory disease, the likely diagnosis here. This is evidenced by adnexial pain, chronic cervicitis and bleeding after intercourse. The positive net for the chlamydia as further went to the, this diagnosis. According to the British Association for Sexual Health and Human Immunovirus BASH guideline, triple antibiotics, either DMC or MO. Uh, what is the most likely diagnosis? Acromegaly, Cushing disease, Cushing syndrome, impaired fasting glucose, type 2 diabetics. A 45-year-old man presented to the endocrinology clinic to discuss the results of a recent dexamethasone separation test. He has gained 15 kg in weight over the last year. He admits to drinking four pints of beer per day. On examination, his BP 149 by 84 and body mass index 32. Hemoglobin 149, WBC normal, platelets normal, sodium normal, potassium normal, creatinine normal. Uh, bicarbonate uh, normal, glucose 8.4, cortisol 450. Morning cortisol after overnight dexamethasone suppression test 32. So the cortisol level here is mildly elevated, and this is just the inconclusive result. And the morning cortisol after overnight dexamethasone suppression test, this is negative. So this is excluding both Cushing's disease as well as the Cushing syndrome. So based on the pictorial, what can be the then most likely diagnosis here with weight gain, PMI? Can it be impaired fasting glucose? The fasting glucose, the fasting yes. glucose, no, the, the fasting glucose here is greater than seven. 
and in case of impaired fasting glucose the level should be in between 6.1 to 6.9 so it can be impaired fasting glucose as well so this is type 2 diabetes this patient has a poor lifestyle and is overweight with excessive calorie and alcohol consumption his lifestyle has led to weight gain over the past years a new diagnosis of diabetes mellitus can be made evidenced by elev elevated in fasting glucose <coughs> Although his one uh, one six zero zero hour cortisol is elevated, this is not diagnostic of a Cushing's disease. A low dose the examination of suppression test is needed to confirm the diagnosis. And twenty four hour urinary catecholamine is usually the investigation of choice in Cushing's disease. And in case of Cushing's syndrome, this should this should not be uh, if, uh, if the Cushing syndrome is characterized by hypercortisolism caused by either adrenal adenoma producing excess cortisol or a pituitary adenoma. Elevated cortisol caused by adrenal adenoma is not suppressed by high dose dexamethasone, while elevated cortisol resulting from pituitary adenoma does get suppressed by this test. So pituitary adenoma will, will get suppressed by high dose dexamethasone test, but adrenal adenoma won't get suppressed. And in case of impaired fasting glucose, so, the, the here, level should be here is the, Sorry. Sorry to interrupt. Yes. Here in the um, cortisol dexamethasone suppression test is 32, low. So why not um, pituitary adenoma? For being positive, for being positive, the level should be greater than 50. Less than 50 is the normal value here. Okay. Okay. What is the most likely diagnosis? Central nervous system lymphoma, glioblastoma, hemangioblastoma, meningioma, vestibular schwannoma. Uh, 58 year old man present to the neurology clinic. He has been experiencing right sided hearing loss, vertigo, and tinnitus, which have worsened over the past year. He has some loss of sensation over the right hand side of his face. Uh, MRI scan of his pain shown below. So there is a lesion, there is a nodular shaped homogeneous lesion in the cerebropontine angle here. And if we look at here, this patient is having the triad of hearing loss, vertigo and tinnitus. So what does the hearing loss, uh, uh, tinnitus and vertigo points towards? Progressive hearing loss, vestibular dysfunction, tinnitus. This typical triad is found in vestibular schwannoma. This is a component of neurofibromatosis type or the central neurofibromatosis. So let me show you the findings. So this type of patient will have the lesion in the cerebropontine angle in this region. Look at there in this region, either in the left or in the right side. So they will always occur in the cerebropontine angle. Look at here. And they should be whitish in color. Just remember the location. This location is pathognomonic of the vestibular short. In every case, the location would be in the cerebral pontine angle. Vestibular schwannomas are characterized by progressive hearing loss, vestibular dysfunction, and tinnitus. They are slow growing, and patients may experience symptoms for several years before presenting to clinicians. Although vestibular schwannomas may impinge on both trisaminal nerve and facial nerve, loss of sensation is more likely than weakness. They are well circumscribed lesion, which develop at the cerebellar pontine angle and can be enhanced on MRI skin using the gadolinium. And CNS lymphoma, central nervous system lymphoma, re uh, relatively rare, accounting for approximately 2.5% of CNS tumor. Multiple CNS lymphoma are often seen and are usually in contact with subarachnoid or ependymal surfaces. They demonstrate low marked enhancement with contrast injection 
and EEA deficiency is a major risk factor for CNS lymphoma development. So CNS lymphoma. So they are the CNS lymphoma, they are often in the scattered form. CNS lymphoma scattered throughout the brain. And glioblastoma, rapidly growing CNS tumor with irregular margin and heterogeneous central signal resulting in necrosis and hemorrhage. Enhancement with contrast is usually peripheral and surrounds areas of necrosis. These tumors are usually localized to the cerebral hemisphere. They present with a more subacute onset of symptoms. They are dependent on uh, lesion location. The median survival uh, of glioblastoma is less than two years. So this glioblastoma usually they occurs on the frontal region of the brain and they will have the sclerosed margin, the whitish colored margin. And more, more commonly, they usually affect the frontal part, but in some cases, they may extend to the parietal region as well. But more commonly, they are seen on the frontal portion. So frontal portion, frontal portion here. Frontal, frontal. The vast majority of the hemangioblastoma occurs in the posterior fossa and may be seen in a similar position to that of the vestibular schwannoma. Hemangioblastoma. So look at here, the hemangioblastoma, they usually affects the posterior part of the brain. In most cases, in the posterior portion. And meningioma, the vast majority of the meningioma are supratentorial and occurs in the parasagittal and spinoidal ring regions. They are slow growing and patient typically presents with headache. Meningiomas normally appear sir, as, as an extra axial mass with broad dural base that extends from the meninges. They are usually homogeneous in appearance and well circumscribed, showing the gadolinium enhancement. So they usually occurs over the sagittal sinus region, occurs in this portion. And in some cases, they will have the dural tail. The dural tail will connect the dura mater with, with that of the tumor. This is known as the dural tail, the line connecting the dura mater and the tumor. And this dural tail is pathognomonic of this meningioma. So here is the dural tail. So again, dural tail here. And in, and in some cases, they may affect the sagittal sinus. And here is also the dural tail. Uh, what is the most appropriate intervention for this patient? I don't was stating intervitreal rani map. Intervitreal triamcinolone, mealtime insulin, panretinal photocoagulation. A 54 uh, year old man referred to the ophthalmology clinic as he has been experiencing worsening buried vision affecting his left eye over the last three days. He has type 2 diabetes and his glucose control has been poor over the last three years. He has transitioned to long acting insulin in addition to metformin and liraglutide. Over the last four months, his most recent glycated hemoglobin level was 54 millimole, uh, and normal with uh, normal ranges less than 42 millimole. Retinal thickness measured by optical coherence tomography, 55 micrometer. A photograph of his left retina is shown below. So this is the patient with type two diabetes with worsening of the blurring of the vision, optical. Uh, the OCT level is increased here. 
and if you look at the picture earlier there is some multiple small hemorrhages and this yellowish colored yellowish color they are the they are known as the pigment deposition this pigment deposition occurs due to the due to the presence of fat particles and this will ultimately lead to the hard exoted initially they will have the pigment deposition followed by the hard exoted and this yellowish color is due to the hard exoted so features of uh, features of uh, features of um, hard exoded along with the small hemorrhage in a patient with diabetes as well as the blurring of the vision points towards the diabetic maculopathy complicated by the wet macular degeneration so what should be the choice of treatment in diabetic complicated diabetic maculopathy or in case of wet macular uh, uh, degeneration vgf yes very good so wet macular degeneration there should be pigment deposition so they are the pigment they are the yellowish colored pigment this will ultimately lead to the hard exudate so this should be treated with intervitreal vgf inhibitor and we have the option like bevacizumab ranibizumab and aflipercept and this anti vgf anti vitreal vgf is indicated when the retinal thickness is above 400 micrometer so here this is above above 400 micrometer so we can go with the anti vgf so can anyone tell me the alternative alternative uh, to anti-vgf in case of uh, diabetic megalopathy what are the alternative options Laser can, yes very good we, we can either go with focal photocoagulation or focal laser therapy or focal laser photocoagulation let me show you some of the more picture regarding the diabetic megalopathy So the fat in the center, this fat are due to the pigment deposition and this will ultimately lead to the hard exudate and there is some dots of, oh, sorry, and there is some dots of the blood here and also look at here, there is some small hemorrhages and there is pigment deposition leading to hard exudate. So we can, and since the OCT is greater than 400, we can go with the intravitreal Rani Bichum or the anti ear. Ranibizumab is an antivascular endothelial growth factor agent and is the intervention of choice for diabetic macular edema. The diagnosis is confirmed by retinal photograph, which oh, shows no. multiple small MRS and the sarsenate of heart exudate. Based on the NICE guideline, the ranibizumab is indicated when the retinal thickness is greater than 400 micro, uh, gram, micrometer. Aflibercept and bevacizumab are the potential alternatives. When anti-VGF, uh, anti-VEGF agents are not suitable, contraindicated or partially effective, focal laser photocoagulation or focal laser therapy are the alternative choices. What is the most likely diagnosis? Janssen arteritis, granulometrosis, polyangiitis, polymyalgia, rheumatica, renal adenocarcinoma, Transitional cell carcinoma of the bladder. A 72 year old woman present to the AMU with deteriorating health, which she has worsened over the last few months. She complains of weight loss and night sweat. She also been experiencing joint pain and stiffness, particularly affecting her shoulder and hips, and which is worse in the morning. Her general practitioner has prescribed her 25 milligram pregnancy per day but this has not impacted her symptom. On examination, her BP 155 by 85, pulse 69, regular. Her abdomen is soft and non-tender and no masses can be detected. Hemoglobin low, 105, WBC 11.9. Platelets are normal, so sodium normal, potassium normal, creatinine 131, yes sir, 87, urine, blood three plus protein negative. Hmm. 
So this patient is having the features of joint stiffness and this is also satisfying the SAR criteria of 50 by 50, AS is greater than 50. ESR is greater than 50, but there are some other associated condition as well, like uh, leukocytosis, anemia, as well as the hematuria. So this is a case of polymyalgia rheumatica associated condition. So which of the following diagnosis is associated with PMR? GCA, the giant cell arteritis, giant cell arteritis, as well as renal adenocarcinoma. Both of them are associated with polymyalgia rheumatic and in case of giant cell arteritis there should be skull tenderness or there should be features of impending visual loss or there should be skull tenderness or shock location all the features are absent here so it can be giant cell arteritis as well and the patient has also not uh, responded well to the 25 milligram prednisolone so this can also not be the isolated polymyalgia rheumatic as well so which condition is associated with uh, PMR, the, the next condition is the renal adenocarcinoma. So renal adenocarcinoma is a polymyalgia rheumatica associated condition and the patient will have marked hematuria with features of malignancy like night sweats, weight loss, polycythemia and hypercalcemia. So this patient is having the features of malignancy and there is also associated PMR. So the most likely diagnosis is the renal adenocarcinoma. This patient demonstrates marked hematuria and symptoms of underlying neoplasm suggested by night sweat, weight loss, symptoms of a polymyalgia-like symptoms are described in association with adenocarcinoma of the kidney and are said to result following nephrectomy. They normally respond poorly to intervention with corticosteroid. Other neoplastic symptoms association with our renal carcinoma include polycythemia and hypercalcemia, which are the result of increased erythropoietin and parathyroid hormone related pepper. And GCA can also be associated with PMR, but they will have the jaw claudication or features of skull tenderness or, or, with, or with the temporal tenderness, which is also absent here. And GCA should be responsive to prednisolone, but here the patient had no response to prednisolone. And also the hematuria, hematuria does not occur in PMR as well as the giant cell arteritis. And in case of GPA, granulomatosis with polyangitis, patient will have the renopulmonary syndrome. But here the, the creatinine is mildly elevated and there is no features of pulmonary hemorrhage. So it can also be the granulomatosis with polyangitis. And transitional cell carcinoma will come with the features of recurrent microscopic hematuria and usually this type of PMR is not associated with the transitional cell carcinoma. Mm, what is the most likely cause of this patient's symptom? Increased angiotensin 1, increased angiotensin 2, increased bradycanin, decreased 6 keto prostaglandin F1 alpha, Decrease nephrolysis. A 65 year old man present to emergency department following a third episode of angioedema in the past nine months. He takes a number of medications, including ramipil, brisoprolol, amlodipin, atorvastatin, and indapamide. So, this patient is being treated Brilliant. with AC inhibitor, and patient has come up with the features of angioedema. So can anyone tell me why this angioedema occurs in case of AC inhibitor, not in case of ARBS? Rush system, bradyca for bradykinin. Okay, just look at this pictorial. So angiotensinogen is converted to angiotensin 1 with the help of renin. And angiotensin 1 is converted to angiotensin 2 with the help of angiotensin converting enzyme. And in this pathway, the bradykinin is metabolized to the inactive products. And the AC inhibitor, AC inhibitor acts on this step. AC inhibitor causes blockage of conversion of angiotensin 1 to angiotensin 2. So ultimately, the bradykinin won't be metabolized. The bradykinin will remain in the accumulated in the body this bradycanin will cause the angiotensin. But the angiotensin receptor blocker, 
they act on this this pathway the angiotensin receptor blocker they act on this pathway so in the previous pathway angiotensin 1 is being converted to angiotensin 2 and bad ekinin is being metabolized for this reason angiotensin receptor blocker does not cause the angiotema but the ac inhibitor causes the angiotema is that clear yes yeah. okay angiotensin converting enzyme the ac kinase 2 is involved in the metabolism of bradykinin inhibition of ac inhibitor key kinase 2 production leads to increased level of bradykinin it is thought that high level of bradykinin stimulate vasodilatation and increased vascular permeability of post capillary venues this results in plasma extended vasation into submucosa and thus leads to the angiotema and angiotensin receptor blocker do not have the same effect because they act on the next step Um, what is the most appropriate way to dose this patient hydrocortisone? Give a bolus of 100 mg IV and repeat every 6 hours until delivery. Give a bolus of 100 mg IV and repeat every 12 hours until delivery. Increase the monitor morning and evening doses to 20 mg. Keep the same oral dose. Reduce the morning dose to 10 mg. A 24-year-old uh, woman admitted to labor reward. Having gone into labor, this will be her first year. She is 8, 38 weeks pregnant and has adrenal insufficiency. She is kindly taking 15 mg of hydrocortisone in the morning and 10 mg in the evening. Hemoglobin low 103, WBC normal, patellate normal, sodium normal, potassium normal, creatinine normal. And glucose 6.2. So this is a patient with Addison's disease with pregnancy. So what should be the most suitable with respect to patient hydrocortisone? Pregnancy plus Addison's disease. So if there double is double the dose. No, no double the dose. So so if so if there is uh, if there is adrenal insufficiency or Addisonian disease in case of pregnant lady, then we should give hundred milligram hydrocortisone in the IV bolus formulation. And this should be repeat every six hours until the delivery. So this is the guideline. So give a bolus of 100 milligram IV and repeat every six hours until delivery. Liver is a significant physiological stressor and in patient with adrenal insufficiency an increase in corticosteroid replacement is recommended until birth. Liver can affect the absorption of drug from the GI tract. So IV steroid replacement is the preferred option. According to Addison's Disease Society guidelines, a dose of 100 mg every 6 hours is recommended. So 100 mg IV bolus formulation every 6 hours until the delivery of the patient. What is the most appropriate next intervention? Acclidium and formateral combination, fluticosone and salmeteral combination. Montelicus long term pregnant and roughly minused. A 62 year old woman present to the respiratory clinic for review. She complains of worsening shortness of breath, which has developed over the last three months. She was diagnosed with chronic obstetric pulmonary disease two years ago, for which she was prescribed salmon inhaler. Her FEV1 uh, and uh, for, Force vital capacity ratio uh, tested one year ago and was 50 percent of the predicted. Her GP carried out a trial of 40 milligram prednisolone for one week, but this did not lead to an improvement of lung function. The patient continued to smoke 20 cigarettes per day. On examination, BP 142 by 90, pulse 80, and regular. She has bilateral poor ANT on auscultation and risk consists with emphysema. Hemoglobin normal, WBC normal, platelets normal, sodium normal, potassium normal, creatinine normal. So this is a patient with COPD exacerbation and patient is taking the short acting beta agonist. And the patient has not been responsive to the steroid therapy. So what should be the next step? So when to go, when to go with ICS and when to go with LABA in case of COPD? If uh, you saw uh, asthmatic feature, then pregnisolone. Yes. So in case of COPD, 
if the FEV1 is less than 50% and there is features of asthma or steroid responsiveness, then we can go with ICS plus LABA combination. If the FEV1 is greater than 50% and if there is no features of asthma or no features of steroid responsiveness, then we should go with the LABA plus LAMA combination. Here they haven't given the FEV1, but they have said that the patient does not respond to the prednisolone. So we need to go with the long acting beta agonist plus long acting muscarinic agonist combination. So find out the LABA and LAMA from here. Yeah. Yes, we should go with the because fluoric acid sun material combination. This is the ICS. This can be used in this in this case since the patient is not responsive to steroid. Montelukast is only used in the management of asthma. Montelukast has no role in the management of COPD. Rofloomilas is the phosphodiesterase for inhibitor. It is used as the last line of management in the fourth line of management. So actually, so here is a spelling mistake here. Actually, it should be actually. So the long-acting muscarinic antagonist are the triotopium, glycopyrrolate, umeclidinum and aclidinium. So aclidinium here is the lama, long-acting muscarinic antagonist. And salmeterol, formeterol, uh, violenterol and oludaterol, they are the so here for material yeah. is the long acting beta agonist and also look at this very carefully they, they are the long acting beta agonist they are the agonist but they are the muscarinic antagonist they are not the muscarinic agonist always remember lama means muscarinic antagonist not muscarinic agonist so based on nice long acting uh, muscarinic antagonist actually denium and long acting beta agonist for material in a patient with copd or not controlled despite with the short acting broncodial short acting sour therapy and if there is asthmatic features or apv1 less than 50 percent or steroid responsiveness then b would be the answer monte lucas is only specific for asthma not for copd and also rofloomilas is only specific for copd rofloomilas has no role in case of bronchial asthma Uh, what is the most appropriate intervention in this patient? Azathioprine, cyclophosphamide, pregnisolone, ramipril, supported therapy. A uh, 18 year old man present to emergency department complaining of a rash affecting his buttock, uh, the back of his legs, and the ulnar aspect of both arms. He is also experiencing abdominal pain and joint pains affecting both knees and both ankles. He has a respiratory infection a few days before the rash began. On examination, BP 115 by 70 and pulse 65 and regular. His chest is clear. There is a mild abdominal tenderness or palpation and clear pain on movement of the knees and ankle. A purpuric rash is present, particularly over the buttock. Hemoglobin normal, WBC 111.8, platelet 18. Uh, Sodium normal, potassium normal, creatinine normal, ESR 59, urinalysis urine blood 2 plus, protein 1 plus. So diagnosis? Patient is having the recent upper respiratory tract infection few days uh, before and patient has come up with a parboric rash in the buttocks and with mild abdominal tender. So this is the case of IgA nephropathy or IgA vasculitis and usually the IgA nephropathy commonly comes up with the features of hematuria and the hematuria carries the good prognosis and, 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 and most of the cases of IgA nephropathy is self-limiting, no treatment is necessary. So what are the indications for treatment in case of IgA nephropathy? Number one is if there is any evidence of hypertension or if there is any significant renal impairment or if there is any proteinuria. In that cases, choice treatment should be required. And choice of treatment for IgA nephropathy, and then the mnemonic is the APAC. Here is creatinine and urea is normal, only protein in the urine. Yes, that's why I that's why I was saying most of most of the cases of IgA nephropathy are self-limiting. No treatment is required. 
treatment should only be required if there is hypertension or if there is evidence of renal impairment or if there is proteinuria and here which we, we should go with the supportive therapy okay okay but but, but just for the treatment purpose i was saying if if, if the treatment is required then we should go, go with the ic this is known as the apac let me show you So mnemonic is the APAC, APAC starting with AC inhibitor followed by prednisolone followed by azathioprine followed by cyclophosphate. If there is hypertension or if there is renal impairment or if there is proteinuria, then we should go for the treatment. So AC inhibitor followed by steroid, no responsive to steroid, go for steroid sparing agent, azathioprine and if this is a more serious case, like fate in a case with severe renal impairment go for cyclophosphate but here there is no indication for treatment so we can go with the supportive therapy this patient is experiencing immunoglobulin iga vasculitis evidence by abdominal pain purpuric text joint pain proteinuria hemosphere on urine testing the presentation of iga vasculitis often follows a respiratory tract infection this patient bp and creatinine are normal so on this situation supportive therapy is the most appropriate next and the patient will just need the insight as a part of supportive therapy for the control of joint pain. Uh, what is the most likely diagnosis? Primary and renal insufficiency, renal artery stenosis, renal tubular acidosis type 1, RTA type 2, RTA type 4. A 67-year-old man is reviewed in cardiology clinic. He has type 2 diabetics, heart failure, and diabetic nephropathy. He failed to tolerate <clears throat> AC inhibitor because of a rise in potassium without significant change in creatinine. On examination, BP 139.85, pulse 79, and regular. There are calculus at the base on auscultation of the chest. Body mass uh, index is 30. Hemoglobin 137. WBC normal, platelets normal, sodium normal, potassium 5, bicarbonate 20, and creatinine 158. So this patient is having the hyperkalemic metabolic acidosis with renal impairment following introduction of the AC inhibitor. So which RTA? Which RTA is associated with Hyperkalemic metabolic type Yes, hyperkalemic type metabolic four. acidosis worsening with AC inhibitor is the RTA type 4. This patient is experiencing borderline metabolic acidosis and potassium level at the upper end of the normal range to take in together with the history of diabetes, worsening hyperkalemia on initiation of the AC inhibitor. This fits well with the diagnosis of the RTA type 4. And RTA type 4 is most commonly seen in a patient with diabetic nephropathy as well as the chronic interstitial nephropathy, so DN and CIN. And both in case of type 1 and type 2, they will have the hypokalemic metabolic acidosis. Type 2 has association with Fanconi syndrome. Type 1 has association with osteomalacia, nephrocalcinosis, primary biliary cirrhosis, Sjogren syndrome, or the SLE. So this feature should be present in RTA type 1. And RTA type 1 will always have the persistent urinary pH greater than 5.5 despite metabolic acidosis. And choice of treatment is oral bicarbonate or citrate supplementation. And RTA type 2 is associated with Fanconi syndrome as well as the multiple myeloma. So let me add the multiple myeloma. So this is our last question. Uh, what is the most important intervention in this patient? Activated charcoal, flumagenin, foamy, pigeon, naloxone, and anesthetic system. <clears throat> A 41-year-old man is brought to the emergency department with his ex-partner. He is thought to have drunk a large bottle of methanol and left a suicide note. On examination, BP 95 by 70. Pulse 105 bit per minute and regular. 
he is intoxicated. Investigation hemoglobin normal, WBC 11.7. Slightly raised platelets uh, 132. Sodium normal, potassium 5.2. Creatinine 132, bicarbonate 50. What is the appropriate intervention in this patient? So this is a patient with methanol poisoning with significant metabolic acidosis as well as hyperkalemia. So, so what is the antidote for methanol uh, poisoning? What is the antidote? So formepizole, formepizole is actually the antidote for methanol or the ethylene glycol overdose. And, and, and this formepizole, this causes the competitive inhibition of alcohol dehydrogen. Formepizole is used in ethylene glycol and methanol poisoning as well as the uh, ethylene glycol overdose. And this causes competitive inhibition of alcohol dehydrogen. And next one is the activated charcoal. Activated charcoal may have a role in may have a role in case of methanol poisoning, but the specific is with the formepizole. And flumazenil is for the benzodiazepine overdose. Naloxone is for reversal of the opioid intoxication. So, can anyone tell me the methanol poisoning does it cause reversible visual loss or irreversible? Irreversible. So, how does it it causes the uh, visual loss? Pathophysiology. So look at here. In case of methanol overdose, there will be formation of formic acid crystal within the optic nerve. This will lead to optic atrophy and bilateral pale optic disc, leading to irreversible loss of vision. So this irreversible loss of vision occurs due to deposition or precipitation of the formic acid crystal within the optic nerve. Formepizole is a competitive inhibitor of alcohol dehydrogenase and is the intervention of choice for methanol, methanol and ethylene glycol overdose. Methanol is metabolized to formaldehyde, which in turn is oxidized to formic acid. Formic acid is responsible for metabolic acidosis and visual disturbance in methanol overdose. Formepizole has the advantage over using ethanol in this situation because it does not worsen the intoxication. Activated charcoal may have a role, but this is not the specific management. Fumagenil is for the benzodiazepine overdose. Naloxone is for the opioid antagonist or for the management of opioid toxicity. And in acetylcysteine, this is for the staggered paracetamol overdose. So we have completed the 50 questions. So thank you everyone. And we would like to continue earlier from, from next day, inshallah. Okay, thank you everyone. Okay, thank you. Thank you.